What is going on everyone? This is Miles with Windows Central Gaming and welcome to the 18th episode of Xbox Chatterdays. Um, as you might know, we have a little bit of stuff to talk about today. It's been a, a, a pretty eventful week in the Xbox community. The focus of today's show is obviously going to be Phil Spencer's latest comments on Bethesda exclusivity. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit, bit about some upcoming events. And we're just going to be celebrating this, this big news, honestly, for Xbox fans. So if you're new to the show, thanks so much for joining us. To all the awesome people returning, thanks for hanging out on this Saturday. Always have a great time, and I'm excited to get into it. Um, I really want to, you know, if, again, if you're watching live, the main focus of this is going to be a lot of interaction. We're going to be talking a lot about Bethesda. We're going to be talking about what that means for Xbox. And we're going to be talking a bit about why, why we love Bethesda and why this is a really big deal for Xbox. So huge shout out to everyone who's watching live, huge shout out to everyone who's watching after the fact, and let's get right into it, gamers. We have some awesome people in the chat already, Pixel Slappa, Mr. Joanna Dark, Andy K, Damn Good, Deck, Yo Donny, whew, we got, a, we got a squad already, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm coming into a super chat right out of the gate. Ooh, all right, ooh, whoo, mm. Mr. Joanna Dark coming in with $10. Thanks so much. Uh, let's just, we'll dive right into that super chat because it was, it was waiting, bef waiting for me before we even went live today. So appreciate that. Um, hello, Miles. I hope all is well. In the past, Phil Spencer has discussed tiers for Game Pass. Could we see a tier that introduces a Surface Duo type device for a low cost to just stream games portable? Um, that is a very interesting question. There's a lot of people who want to see the the Xbox portable, if you will, the answer to the PS Vita. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, the 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 Surface Duo in particular is an incredibly expensive device. I think it's like fifteen hundred dollars if you buy it outright. So I don't see them doing an alternative, just like cheaper option. Although that would be really cool. I think they're leaning heavily into the fact that a lot of people already have a phone and they have ways to access this. So I don't unfortunately see Xbox doing any sort of dedicated portable Xbox as much as some people do really want to see that. I don't, I don't think Xbox has any interest in making that. <clears throat> ah, sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. My throat was a little dry there for a second. So much, uh, so much hype here. Um, <clears throat> Anthony Vasquez says, Miles, we love you. That's, that's so sweet. I'm, I'm excited. There's a, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, Nathan Drake is joining us in the chat today. That's exciting to see. Um, he says, let me guess you're going to hype up Xbox and Bethesda. We're going to be talking about that for sure. It's a big deal. Um, and it's, it's worth celebrating. It, it means a lot of really cool things for Xbox. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. The first topic of the show today is just going to be talking a little bit about the Xbox Roundtable, the overall presentation what I thought about it and kind of reiterating some of the statements I made previously leading into this week. Because a lot of us, once this deal closed, we wanted to know straight away, are Bethesda games definitively exclusive to Xbox, period? And um, people were a little concerned after Phil's statements on Tuesday because he, ca he came out and um, I'm sure you've seen the sum memes, the sum field. There's, there were so many sum memes. It was, it was pretty awesome to see. Um, because his statement was a little vague. Basically, he came out and said, we're excited, let's go. Bethesda's part of Xbox officially now. The deal is closed, the ink is dried, and some future titles from Bethesda will be exclusive to Xbox and PC. So there was a lot of people in the community on extreme, stream ends. There was the, the contingent of people who said, all Bethesda games will be Xbox exclusives definitively, end of statement. Then you had people on the other side who said, all major Bethesda games will be multi-platform, period, end of story. So you had a lot of people kind of fighting with each other on Twitter on Tuesday after Phil said some future titles. A lot of people were taking that as an opportunity to kind of knock down some of the people who had made those more, more definitive statements about exclusivity. Um, and, you know, there was a, <laughs> some funny tweets from people in the community who were pretty, you know, downtrodden and just beaten, who were kind of feeling... Um, unvalidated in their belief that Bethesda games would be exclusive to Xbox moving forward. So there was, uh, it was kind of a, a roller coaster of emotions between Tuesday and then Thursday when Xbox hosted this roundtable. 
uh, featured Phil Spencer, Pete Hines, Todd Howard, Sarah Bond, Eric Greenberg, Aaron Losey, uh, and many more people from Xbox and Bethesda talking about kind of what this means. Um, and I, I love that they did this. I talked about this previously, but um, there was just so much genuine like excitement and energy between everyone on the panel. And it genuinely felt like a group of really close friends, like embarking on this big venture together. And it was, it was just fun. Like the energy was so good and so positive. It could have came across really campy, really corny and really forced, which is, I mean, kind of unfortunately been a, um, a trademark of Xbox presentations of, of the past, but this was, the messaging was great. The pacing was great. And the energy from every single person on this, um, round table was just through the roof. Everyone was legitimately excited. And that makes me really excited about the future because obviously everyone invested in this partnership is stoked. They're really excited about what this means for the games. And at the end of the day, that is the most important thing about all of this is what this means for the games. So I'm really excited that they went around every single developer that's in this kind of acquisition and talked to them about what this means for them. And I talked about this previously and I said, that's, that's what Xbox should do when they, when they, you know, when the ink is dried, when the deal is done, Xbox needs to come out and they need to basically tell gamers what this means for Bethesda games. What can Bethesda do now that they couldn't do previously because of the resources that Xbox has granted them? And we saw some amazing comments from, from a lot of the developers. And one of the, the coolest parts for me was when Matt Booty was talking about those, those meetings where they would get all the, all the basically like leads of these different studios together and show the projects that they're working on and give each other feedback. And I think that's going to be incredibly important and incredibly valuable for Xbox moving forward. They're going to have a lot of talented teams with expertise in different areas who are going to be able to look at what Todd Howard is working on, look at what Joe Neat and Ray are working on, and basically <clears throat> give them feedback. Say, hey, we are experts in first-person shooters. So if you, you want to have a first-person shooting mechanic in here, let, let, let's give you some tips on that. And then you have the RPG experts. Okay, you're trying to put RPG systems and mechanics in your game. We have 30 years of experience with that. Here's, here's where you can improve that. So long-term, that's gonna be huge for Xbox. And that's gonna be something that Xbox can seriously leverage, and I hope they do, to put out, as Phil Spencer says, the best games that Bethesda's ever put out. So I'm really glad that that's what they leaded with. But before they got into all of this, Phil Spencer did address the enormous elephant in the room regarding Bethesda exclusivity. Because <clears throat> as we saw on Tuesday, people were blowing up Xbox as to what this means, why they weren't more definitive. People wanted answers. You can't, with an acquisition of this size, um, a lot of hardcore fans weren't going to let Phil Spencer just say some future titles and then leave it at that. And then because a lot of people in the community are just so sick and tired of talking about Bethesda exclusivity, myself included. It's a big deal. I get it. I get people want answers, but I'm, I'm really glad that from this point on, we can move past that and we can start talking about the games. We can start talking about the stuff we want to look forward to as opposed to, will this game be exclusive? Will this game be exclusive? And that's still going to be a huge conversation until a lot of these contracts close and we move past probably the next year. It's probably still going to be rampant for the next year. Um, but for people within the Xbox community, it's kind of a done deal. We, we know what the answer is now. I'm going to read a, I'm going to read the quote from Phil Spencer real quick here, just so we all have that for context. If you aren't aware exactly what he said, so let me get that real quick. I'm going to try to be as clear as I can. So obviously I can't sit here and say that every Bethesda game is exclusive. We know that's not true. There are contractual obligations that we're going to see through as we always do in every one of these instances. We have games that exist on other platforms and we're going to support those games on the platforms they're on. But if you're an Xbox customer, the thing I want you to know now is this is about delivering great exclusive games for you that ship on platforms where Game Pass exists. That's our goal. That's why we're doing this. That's the root of this partnership we're building. So that is a quote from Phil Spencer addressing exclusivity with Bethesda games. And this backs up a lot of what pe a lot of the people in the community have been saying that, you know, there are contractual obligations that they will see through. Um, they are not going to, you know, try to buy out the part, uh, the, buy out those contracts or um, 
you know, pull out of those contracts. There's too much legality involved. So that's why Phil Spencer, I guess, was maybe a little more timid with his response because they couldn't come out of the gate and just give you a definitive, they are all exclusive. Every single Bethesda game will be exclusive definitive. They just couldn't. Legally, they couldn't. And so it was just easier for Phil to throw out a word like some. And I, um, maybe not ironically, but funny, funny enough, I'm sure there was a team of probably like 20, 30 people who came up with the word some. That was probably a very carefully thought out, curated word. As benign as it seems to a lot of people, there was probably a lot of thought put into some. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so that statement really paints a clear picture of Xbox's long-term goals for Bethesda games. Um, basically what that tells me, and that tell, should tell everyone, is that Bethesda games will be Xbox Game Pass exclusives. Or not, they didn't say Xbox, or they didn't say Bethesda games will be Xbox and PC exclusives. That line about where Game Pass exists is very, very curated to boost Game Pass subscribers. They are not going to eliminate the possibility of Game Pass coming to platforms like the, uh, the Switch, Nintendo, or PlayStation, because they would love that. They want that. They want that market share. And when you put Game Pass on Nintendo and PlayStation, regardless of if you're a person who would never buy an Xbox console, they have you invested in the Xbox ecosystem in this way. They have you playing their games. And most importantly for them on a business level, they're getting that sweet money. So that would be huge. And I'm sure those conversations are happening. I don't know, you know, how PlayStation especially, I feel like would be the most hesitant to offer that, but that is their plan. So they are basically not going to take away games that already exist on current platforms. And they don't want to basically come out with a statement that says like, oh, you want to play these games? Buy an Xbox. They're basically shifting the messaging to be, you want to play these games? We have Game Pass. It's a great option for you. You can play an Xbox, you can play a PC, you can play a mobile. And you know what? We've reached out to PlayStation and Nintendo about getting Game Pass on there so you can play these great games on the console you love. But, you know, it's out of our hands. And so that's going to be putting a lot of pressure on PlayStation and Nintendo to offer Xbox Game Pass as a service on their platform. Because either way you look at it, people are not going to skip games like The Elder Scrolls 6. And if that is an Xbox exclusive, Xbox Game Pass exclusive, they are either going to buy an Xbox to play that or they are going to sign up for Game Pass on their PC, which theoretically is pulling that person out of a Nintendo or PlayStation ecosystem to play these games. But if they put Game Pass on their ecosystem, people are just going to, you know, subscribe to the service and play on their Switch, play on their PlayStation, which still boosts Xbox market share, makes people more aware of Xbox games. And, you know, even without a huge slate of like must play exclusives, Xbox has been seeing huge growth with Game Pass. So once we start getting these massive AAA releases, Game Pass is going to be an insane value. And generally speaking, the average person is not going to ignore, ignore that. They're not going to skip that. And when you say you can play Starfield, you can play Elder Scrolls, you can play Fallout, you can play Doom, you can play Wolfenstein for one monthly subscription fee, like that is a hard value to argue against. And I understand people like to buy games outright, and that's still an option that never goes away, but it's something that as time goes on and people understand more what Game Pass is, as we saw with Netflix and Disney Plus, once people understand how these services work and the value they add, you know, word of mouth just takes off and these services just exponentially grow. Disney Plus is at 100 million subscribers already, primarily because of one killer app. Mandalorian, I'm sure, was a huge boon for that service alone. So once we get Halo Infinite, once we get Starfield, you get those two massive games. If they come out in 2021, we're going to see Game Pass subscribers just through the roof. Um, so I'm really excited to see how, how all that plays out. And shout out to the 110 people joining us already. Let's go. Let's get excited. If you're enjoying the show, like. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. And if you want to get more people in here chatting with me, go ahead and share this video out. I, I, I really appreciate it. And I'm going to get to a few super chats here because we got people popping them off. Huge ups. What do we got here? We got Brad from Xbox News here. Miles, you're a natural. You're a natural. You need to do streams. Keep it up, brother. Hey, I appreciate that. Um, as I just fumbled that line. <laughs> Sorry, let me read that again. Miles, you're a natural. You need to do streams. Keep it up, brother. There we go. Now I actually sound like a natural. 
Appreciate that, my dude. Um, I've been having a lot of fun with it. I've been getting that comment a lot and it's good to hear because, you know, I talk about this a lot, but I edit my myself on, on video a lot and it's, um, you know, I make myself cringe a little bit. So I'm glad people enjoy it. Another super chat from Mr. Joanna Dark, killing the game out here. Besides wanting an evil within three, could Microsoft invest and expand Tango Gameworks and have them produce JRPGs to fill the Final Fantasy 16 void? Could Tango be used to acquire other Japanese studios? I've seen some kind of wild speculation from people that, you know, they want to, you know, use Tango as a way to infiltrate Japanese culture and use Tango Gameworks to convince other Japanese developers that they need to join Xbox. And, you know, maybe that'll happen organically. Maybe once these teams, once we start seeing Tango Gameworks games under the Xbox banner come out and be incredible, maybe people will see the value of that and it'll kind of open up the possibility. Um, it sounds like there's always been complex kind of legalities involved. And, you know, there's some people who believe that, you know, Japanese companies just have no interest in working with American companies. And maybe there's some truth to that in some cases. But I think at this point, a lot of these companies want to be as global as possible. They want to have the biggest market share possible. So when you look at Xbox, especially host Bethesda, they are very appealing. Um, we've seen so many developers come out and basically state how beneficial Game Pass is to them as developers, how beneficial this Xbox partnership is to them. So there's a lot of kind of pull for people who are like, you know what, we're kind of financially struggling. We, we have big ideas, we have big ambitions, but we're scared that if we take a risk and take a gamble, that we're gonna put out a game that we're passionate about, we're excited about, it's not gonna connect with an audience and we're gonna have to close down. Because that is a reality. People spend years and years and years of their lives working on these projects. And if they don't take off, it's so hard to financially recover from that. And even Bethesda has been in those situations where they've been financially struggling. And so I'm sure for them, this is a huge kind of weight off their chest. They have the, the backing of these piles of Microsoft money um, to kind of support them. And... <clears throat> You know, some people look at this as kind of like a sinister thing, like, oh no, Xbox is coming out and they're consolidating consolidating the industry. You know, there's some concerns here. There's some red flags. This is going to be bad for gaming. Watch out, gamers. But I think at the end of the day, we have someone in charge of Xbox who loves gaming. Phil Spencer undoubtedly loves gaming. And that is huge. And that's very important. That's going to drive a lot of business decisions. Obviously, Microsoft wants to make money, and that's why they're investing so heavily in pushing and marketing Xbox Game Pass. But the leadership team and a lot of the people involved with Xbox are doing it because they love gaming. They're not doing it for sinister reasons to become millionaires and basically just swoop up piles of money. That's not their prerogative. Um, they are doing it because they want talented people, creative people to have the means to make great games. And in turn, you know, for them, if they have talented teams making great games, people are going to buy them. So it's kind of a win-win in the, this kind of perfect scenario. If everything works out as Xbox intends, if Game Pass ends up being this, this megaton service that no one can ignore, the true Netflix of gaming, then that's just going to mean more consistent great games for us. And I'm all about that. I'm all about getting amazing games for a super low price because despite what people think, uh, you know, I don't make the YouTube millions. Uh, 70 bucks per pop, it's expensive. That's a big hit on the wallet. So, you know, give me some flexibility here. Respect my, uh, my money. And that's something that Xbox is clearly working to do. And that's something they've invested a lot of time and energy in as of late. So a lot of exciting things with Game Pass. <clears throat> we have a super chat from Jonathan Anaya. Sorry if I butchered that. Miles, phony gamers prefer shareholder profits over gamers. I feel, the, I feel that the Xbox community has the exact opposite mentality. <sighs> the reality is a lot of us aren't finance majors. The reality is a, a lot of people in the community don't directly benefit from NPD. Um, so you have a lot of people who use NPD and sales figures and all this stuff to kind of push whatever na narrative they want confirmation bias that their platform or this game that they like is definitively better than this game because of these sales figures. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's kind of an old fashioned way to look at it. NPD is a super, I'll say a super antiquated measure of the, the industry. Um, for the most part, it doesn't even track digital sales, which is insane. Digital sales at this point are becoming the majority of game sales. 
Why are we looking at stuff like NPD to dictate, you know, what is the most successful thing? Obviously there is some kind of support, there is some, you know, evidence that we can point to with NPD figures. Um, the PlayStation hardware is just raking in tons of money. PS5 is, what was it, the, a record-breaking kind of dollar amount, which which is huge, and that that's something to celebrate and be excited about. But when it comes to the, the games themselves, until NPD is factoring in digital sales more accurately, it's hard to really look at that as a metric for success. And then with the, the rise of subscription services and platforms, um, NPD is going to become more and more irrelevant when it's looking at individual titles. Um, but yeah, I don't know. A lot of us aren't finance experts and a lot of people using that um, are just using it for ill intentions. They're not doing it because, you know, they they love the the creative process of gaming. They're doing it because they want to say the games that they like and the games that they're playing are better than the games that you like and you're playing. And that's the only reason that they bring those figures up because otherwise they don't care about it at all. I promise you that. Yo, Donnie coming in with a $30 super chat. Ding! Appreciate that. That's huge. Thanks, man. Thanks for your thanks for your review of the medium. Finished it last night. I was blown away and appreciative of your review. Got it on Game Pass, so take this money and words of appreciation. Damn, dude, that's awesome. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you played it through. Um, it's one of those games that you know did get some mixed reviews, but I really loved it. I loved what that team was trying to do. Bloober team is a very passionate creative team that I want to see get those resources to make the big game that they want to make because even with small budgets and small teams they've been delivering some really impressive horror games I'm a huge horror nerd I've said that countless times I want to see Bloober get a fat stack of money to make the true Silent Hill successor so I'm glad you like that I think for them this game has been huge in terms of notoriety in terms of sales in terms of like you know, people talking about Bloober Team and what they can do. This has been a huge boon for them. So I think we're going to see some pretty cool stuff in their future. Keep an eye out for Bloober's next project because I think it's going to going to be a big one. All right, let me catch him on the chat here. We got some, we got Hazador. Who else is in here? Pong Soul, Dr. Vortex, Johan Cross. 150 people joining us right now. Really appreciate that. Again, if you're new, hit like, share it out. This is kind of a newer little endeavor that we're doing, but you know, we have an amazing community of people tuning in every week. And it's, you know, legitimately one of my favorite things every week is to just get on the stream and talk to you guys. And that's why with this particular episode, I didn't have a guest because I wanted to talk to you guys. I wanted to talk to the Xbox community about Bethesda and what this means for Xbox moving forward, because there's so much energy on Twitter, so much energy about Xbox right now. And it's, you can feel it. It feels good. It's a good time to be an Xbox fan. And you know, that's why I really want to, you know, get input for you. We're going to have some kind of fun interactive stuff for people watching live later on. Um, but yeah, that I purposely did not have a guest this week because I was going back and forth and I was like, you know what? There's big news. I should get a big guest. We should do something big and have somebody big on so we can talk about Bethesda exclusivity and blah, blah, blah. And then I got to thinking more. I'm like, you know what? Like looking at Twitter, looking at the people blowing up my feed, looking at people just being excited. I was like, this needs to be a community centric act. This needs to be a community-centric episode because that's what this is about. After watching that roundtable, I knew definitively, like, I got to talk to the community because that's what the roundtable was about. It was messaging the community directly because Xbox, more than PlayStation, and more than Nintendo especially, listen and engage with the community. And that's why we got that comment from Phil because I'm sure he was getting blown up after Tuesday and he's like, I got to come out and say it. I got to give these people more insights. I owe them that. And I think that's a really great place for Xbox to be when it comes to this relationship with the community. So let's go. Let's get excited. I'm excited. I hope you can tell. Uh, True Gamer with a $5 super chat. Sony has said they plan to offer something like Game Pass. If true, then there won't be Game Pass on PlayStation. Nintendo, I can see in a few years. PS won't happen. I don't know. I, will, I am not going to say that PlayStation won't happen because regardless of... If PlayStation has a proper answer to Game Pass, which I'm in the camp that at this point they need to have a proper answer to Game Pass really soon, um, or it's going to be a, a tough uphill battle for them to close that gap. We look at PlayStation now, which has been around longer and has way, way, way less subscribers and is way less appealing. Um, but I would never say that Play or Game Pass will not come to PlayStation in some capacity, because at the end of the day, that's not going to give them Bethesda games. 
Um, and then if Xbox does acquire another big publisher, let's say hypothetically, Xbox acquires a, a Capcom, which has this legacy with PlayStation. You have Resident Evil, you have Devil May Cry, you have Monster Hunter. You have a lot of massive franchises that PlayStation fans love. That's not going to be on PlayStation subscription service. And so is PlayStation going to put themselves in a position where, you know, they're going to tell their fans like, eh, you don't need to play those. You don't need to play Elder Scrolls 6. You don't need to play Starfield. You don't need to play Resident Evil 9. You don't need to play Monster Hunter World 2. You don't need to play any of those. We have we have our own subscription service. Play it here. We're going to lock you to this box. Are, are they going to do that? Because I think that would be kind of silly for them because people are not going to ignore those releases, like I said. He, the bigger that Xbox Game Studios gets, and if they do get another publisher on that level, they are not gonna, you're not gonna skip Resident Evil. You're not gonna skip Monster Hunter World. You are going to buy an Xbox, or you are going to buy a PC and get Xbox Game Pass on your PC. So for PlayStation to completely ignore that and sh put up this wall, which, I mean, historically that's been their MO, that is going to hurt them. Unfortunately, Xbox is swinging for the fences and they are putting a lot of pressure. It's out in the open that, oops, let me just punch this mic. It's out in the open that Xbox wants Game Pass on everything, everywhere. And so PlayStation would be the hurdle. And PlayStation fans who want to play these games know that PlayStation would be the, the hurdle that they can't play Game Pass games on PlayStation. It's not because it's impossible. It's because PlayStation is not letting you do that. And people don't like to be told what they can and can't do and where they can and can't play, um, as we saw with the Kinect. That was a, a horrible launch. People were forced to buy the Kinect when they didn't want it. And, you know, people were very spiteful, rightfully so, that they had to do this. And that's going to be the position that PlayStation is going to put themselves in if they say, no, no Game Pass ever. Sorry. So I don't see that as a definitive thing that will never happen. Uh, as we saw with crossplay, if enough people put pressure on PlayStation, they will eventually cave. And that's going to be the reality. When, when we start getting those... Like I said, when we start getting those massive AAA releases that you can't ignore, um, PlayStation can't just be like, eh, sorry, go buy an Xbox. Is that going to be their messaging? Oh, you want to play Elder Scrolls? Go buy an Xbox. How does that come across as a PlayStation player? But yes, I, I have seen that. I've had, and that is the biggest question mark right now is how is PlayStation going to respond to this? Because I'm sure they don't want Game Pass. They don't want a big Xbox logo on the PlayStation store. And they don't want people to understand the true value of Game Pass because it makes PlayStation Now especially look very inferior, which at this point it is. I mean, like I said, even without humongous, massive must-play games, Game Pass is crushing PS Now in terms of growth. PlayStation Plus has kind of been their, their answer to that, which is great. PlayStation Plus is awesome. PlayStation Plus is killing it, especially when you compare that to games with, or yeah, uh, Gold, Xbox Live Gold. So... You have these two conflicting ideals between PlayStation and Xbox. You have PlayStation Plus crushing games with gold, and then you have Xbox Game Pass crushing PS Now. And so, you know, I, I don't know if Xbox really plans to bridge the gap with gold, or if that's just going to be some supplemental thing they keep around just for like, eh, it's added value, it's X dollars per month that you get, and they're going to use it as marketing buzzwords for just more, I guess, like casual audiences. Because the hardcore understand that it's not, compared to PlayStation Plus specifically, it's not the best deal. But once the casuals understand the value of Xbox Game Pass, that's going to be a much easier narrative to sell than, than PlayStation now. We got Derek in the mix. Derek, Griffin Jones, John Luke Williams, Nick W. Dude, we have Binyabik. We have so many awesome people in here, and I, I appreciate y'all hanging out. Nick W. Super Chat, $10.00. Support today has been awesome. You guys are awesome. Love you. Love this community. Love doing this show. And I'm glad people are connecting with it. But Nick W says, how are you doing? I feel over. I feel very overwhelmed by the amount of great games available on Game Pass. For real. When, when I booted up Game Pass and saw that wall of Bethesda games, I was like, oh my God. I, I downloaded a Wolfenstein, New Order, and Old Blood because I need to replay New Order so I can actually play Old Blood because I never played Old Blood. And then I was like, oh, I need to play Prey. And then they came out and said, you know, FPS boost is coming for these five games next week. I'm like, am I going to really play Skyrim again? Is that about to happen? And it's, <laughs> Game Pass is insane. Game Pass is hard to keep up with. And it's going to get to that point where 
Game Pass is going to be like Netflix and where it's like you you don't play everything. It's not about playing everything. It's about playing the games that you want. And they're going to have a slate of games for anyone and everyone. And that's going to be great to see because already at this point right now, it is hard to keep up with Game Pass games. I see so many awesome games that I want to play just like Netflix or HBO. Whenever I boot up those services, I'm like, oh, I'm, I really want to watch that movie. Oh, this show. I've heard great things about this show. And then, you know, you push it off and push it off and you don't end up watching it. And, you know, that's going to be Game Pass. I have all these games installed right now that I haven't played. And Lord knows when I'll realistically play them. And yeah, feeling overwhelmed is a very accurate way to kind of put the, the scope of Xbox Game Pass right now. And then we got Binyabik. Welcome to the supporter tier. Join in the channel as a member, which is awesome. Um, really appreciate that. And yeah, if you guys want to want to join the channel as a member, that goes a long way to support us. M me specifically, um, because like I said, I'm, I'm freelance with Windows Central right now. So the long term goal with the show and with this channel is to kind of build up the, you know, the, the, the boring business side of things. Basically, we need to justify the cost of giving me a salary at the end of the day. So right now I'm just a rogue agent freelance. You know, if anyone's watching, wants to scoop me up, you know, offers out there, but no, just kidding. But yeah, no, the super chats, the supports, the members, that goes a really long way. That's something I can show the executives at our company and be like, people invest with what we're doing. People are excited about what we're doing. And that way we can, you know, invest more in the show, invest more into the production of this, make it so, you know, I'm not doing every single thing. <laughs> no. Um, but no, seriously, really genuinely cannot stress enough how much that, that means to me as just an average dude who loves Xbox, talking about Xbox with a community of amazing, passionate people. All right, dude, whew, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm just excited right now. There's a lot of energy. There's a lot of people chatting. So obviously, you know, that energy and excitement is palpable. Humdrum Dog 0211 with a $2 super chat. What happens to Xbox if Game Pass is on PS and Switch? Xbox makes a ton of money is what happens if Game Pass is on PlayStation and Switch. I've seen people in the community kind of message me, especially after my last video that I did, basically saying that PlayStation and Nintendo can't ignore Xbox Game Pass anymore, which I think is definitively absolutely true, especially from a business perspective. The, the idea of the, the, the box, the co traditional console, Unfortunately, is it's going away. I'm, you know, I'm a, a filthy console heathen. I'll be a console heathen for as long as they make them because that's just how I grew up. That's where I prefer to play. But at the end of the day, console gaming is niche. And I don't mean that as an insult to anyone. I don't mean that to downplay console gaming at all because I love it. It's, it's where I play the most. I have a gaming PC. I could play most of my games on PC, but I don't. I just like the console feeling. But at the end of the day, that is very small it's a very small piece of the pie very small piece of the pie and xbox wants to make that piece much bigger and so with expanding game pass they are going to where the people want to play if people want to play on their ipad if people want to play on their phone if people want to play on their switch xbox wants to cater to that because that's how people play people are just going to go where it's most convenient and that's the reality the average person is not going to buy five, pay $500 for a Series X or a PS5 and then $70 per game. That's, I'm sorry, that's, that's a very small fraction of the people who are interested in gaming. Obviously, the, the core and the people very passionate about it and very invested in the hobby are going to do that. But in terms of like the average person, that's, that's a huge ask. When you can say, hey, you want to play Halo Infinite with your homies? 15 bucks and you got a phone. Boom, you're set. You got a PC at home? You want to play with your homies on your browser? You don't even have to have a good PC. Boom, 15 bucks, you're set. You're playing Halo Infinite with the, with the squad. Stuff like that is going to be huge. And so, you know, I've seen people say, well, if it comes to PlayStation, if it comes to Nintendo, then Xbox console is going to die. Um, but at the end of the day, Xbox now is not... Uh, ironically, Xbox is not about the box anymore. They have a great box. They're going to continue to support that for the next you know, probably decade at least, I would say, but long-term, way down the road, it's gonna get to a point like Netflix. You don't have a Netflix box, you just have, it's on your TV. It's on whatever device you have and you just boot it up and you play or you watch what you want. That's what Game Pass is gonna be. And that's what Xbox wants Game Pass to be. No matter where you are, no matter what device you're on, boom, Game Pass is there. We're gonna see Xbox Game Pass integrated into TVs. You're gonna buy a Samsung TV out of the box Xbox Game Pass app is going to be native on that box and you're going to have 
access to Xbox's library with with the TV you bought. It's that's that is the future of Xbox. So some people are against that, and I get it. It it hurts to see something you love kind of change and shift in such a drastic way, but that's the reality. And that's that's where the future is going. I used to buy a ton of physical CDs. I used to buy a ton of physical movies. Um, and I used to have dedicated like high end, you know, machines to play those things. I used to have a great stereo system. I used to have a great uh, like high high def Blu-ray player uh, back when I was more invested in that. But now, I'll sacrifice a little fidelity to just play it on my my Xbox or my TV. Honestly, it's just way more convenient, way easier. Um, and you will have the people who are still invested in that super premium experience. And th that's not going to change how they play. So they're going to invest in high-end PCs. They're going to invest in high-end consoles. But Xbox wants to have a much broader appeal. So I don't think it's going to hurt Xbox. In fact, I think it's going to have the exact opposite effect. If we see Xbox Game Pass on PlayStation and Nintendo, whew, Game Pass subs are going to just fly through the roof. It's going to be unreal. And shout out to the almost 200 people. Oh, it's, it's a great day. Um, let's again, I, I hate to harp on this, but unfortunately YouTube's algorithm forces me to harp on the likes, the shares, the comments, all that stuff. As a lot of, you know, I, I try not to talk about the YouTube stuff cause it's boring and no one wants to hear about it, but that's the name of the game. Um, unfortunately, as much as I talk about how games are not made by an algorithm, YouTube's platform is 100% an algorithm that you kind of have to stroke and cater to. So I'm doing my best not to be annoying, not to be cheesy, but also play the game, y'all. Play. <laughs> okay, Bing Yabik with a $2 super chat. Y'all just crushing it with super chats today. Uh, PS Switch have an internet browser. GP will, exact, and that's, another, that's a great point, Bing Yabik, is they have internet browsers. So once it gets to the point where those internet browsers can support um, just going to the, the web-based client for Game Pass, even if PlayStation and Nintendo don't support it natively, people can go on those browsers and play those games. So at the end of the day, Game Pass will be on your Switch and your PlayStation in some way, shape, or form. A native app would probably be a much better experience than a console-based web browsing kind of experience, but at the end of the day, it's something you can try. And I'd be curious to see how well that works. And if you guys are in the chat and if you've gotten the latest update for the Xbox build that has the new version of Edge, have you played Stadia on there? Have you booted up the new Edge app on Xbox and tried Stadia? And if so, what has that experience been like? I'll kind of scan the chat and see if anyone has done that. I haven't done it yet. I've been meaning to just to see like, is a console browser a, a good option for these streaming services? Is this something that's gonna become more common and kind of mainstay? All right, so catching up on the chat here real quick. John Brown, Frostbite, Shiny so yeah. I'm seeing some new faces in here, so thanks for joining us. I really appreciate that. The returning legends like Pixel Slapper, Yodani, Mr. Joanna Dark, and then some new faces. And then we got Vegetarian Kaneke. <laughs> Sorry if I butchered that. Hey Miles, what do you think is what do you think Phil Spencer is teasing? Sorry. What do you think is Phil Spencer is te oh, sorry, this I'm just butchering this. What do you think is Phil Spencer teasing some? Okay. What do you think? Is Phil Spencer teasing something by saying that he is going to Tokyo? I know that Phil Spencer has gone to Japan in, in the last year and had some meetings with some, some people, some, some pe big people for some, from some big Japanese developers. And I think he's just really excited about kind of revisiting those conversations and revisiting you know, what this all means. Now that the Bethesda deal is closed, now that they have some more flexibility with you know, third-party partnerships, first-party partnerships, acquisitions, I think Phil Spencer's just excited to get back out there and see what, see what he can swing. Because Phil Spencer loves Japanese gaming, he loves Japanese developers, and he's made it crystal clear that Xbox is investing in Japanese development heavily. They want more partnerships, they want more developers. So I think that's just more of a general statement saying like, I want to get back out there. I want to revisit these people, revisit some of these conversations we've had and, you know, see how we can fit what they're doing into the Xbox platform and ecosystem. And that's all I'll say on that. All right. So, um, exclusivity, what this means for Xbox. We talked about this a little bit, but the Bethesda exclusivity is a humongous deal. Having Phil Spencer come out and basically say that, you know, 
all Bethesda games moving forward will not only launch day one in Xbox Game Pass, but most of them will be Xbox Game Pass exclusives is humongous for Xbox. Um, I'm not going to argue the narrative that Xbox has had kind of mediocre games launch in Xbox Game Pass. You can argue that. There's been amazing titles. Forza Horizon 4, Gears 5 have been incredible. And they've, for me, really sold the value. Like having a games on that scale launching into the service, for me in particular, is huge. But objectively, Gears 5 and Forza Horizon 4 are not necessarily must-play. Like, I will sign up for Game Pass only to play those games. I would say arguably that Xbox hasn't had a single one of those yet since Game Pass launched. And again, not to say that those games are bad. Sea of Thieves, I've said it countless times, is one of Xbox's most important games of the last generation. One of my, my favorite games of all time. I absolutely love Sea of Thieves. I understand the criticisms, especially at launch for that title though. So it, it's hard to say up until this point that Xbox has had, you have to play this game. You have to play this game on Xbox Game Pass. Similar, again, I'm going to use the Mandalorian comparison. Everyone was watching Mandalorian. People who love Star Wars. People, don't, people who don't really care about Star Wars. Everyone was watching and talking about the Mandalorian because of the ease of access. And that's going to be the point, or that's going to be the future for Xbox Game Pass. When Halo Infinite drops, everyone is going to be talking about Halo Infinite. No matter who you are, where you're playing, it's going to be so easy to access and play Halo Infinite. Not only is the multiplayer a free-to-play component, but you can access the campaign and co-op with Xbox Game Pass. And that just word of mouth is going to just really exponentially grow Xbox Game Pass because it's going to be, again, impossible to ignore. Halo is huge. People you know, can criticize Halo and criticize the, the staying power of the brand and kind of the health of the brand. And sure, there's been a couple mediocre releases along the way, but generally speaking, people still love and really care about Halo. You look at the Master Chief Collection, it's still getting like 130,000 peak players on Steam right now, which is, which is huge. That is humongous. You cannot ignore that. That is a very healthy place for an old collection of games to be. And then once that drops, once Halo Infinite drops to a huge pool, console, PC, mobile, browser, Halo Infinite is going to be massive absolutely massive again and then if starfield releases which there's the rumors that there is a 2021 window targeted for starfield if that releases in 2021 if you have a one-two punch of starfield as an exclusive to game pass halo infinite as an exclusive to game pass i want i challenge you to find someone you know who is going to be like i don't care about either of those games i don't care about starfield i don't care about halo that's that that person is a very small fraction of the gaming community um, again, I'm not saying you have to love Halo or you have to just be massively hyped about Starfield, but to say that you genuinely don't care about either of those at all is, for me, would be that would be pretty shocking. Pretty, pretty shocking. So as I'm going through and catching up here on the chat and the super chats, I'm going to do a series of kind of Bethesda-centric community questions for you all. And I really want to see some, some responses here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose some tough questions. And we're going to make you choose between things you love. So first one I'm going to hit you guys with. You can only pick one. One has to go. Elder Scrolls, Fallout. Let's go. That's going to be the first one here. Opposable Thumbs asks... Hey Miles, if Game Pass comes to PlayStation and Switch, do you think Xbox would require their exclusives come to Xbox? <laughs> Might annoy Xbox fans if Sony could get Xbox games, but not the other way around. I no, I don't. I don't think Xbox would ever do that. Um, because again, Xbox's appeal right now is they want they want more people playing their games. They're going to bring their games everywhere that they possibly can. And if you know PlayStation wants to wall off their exclusives to a a box. That's their prerogative. They have every right to do that. That's That's been their MO for a while now. But Xbox is not, that is not their strategy. They don't want to do that. They're not going to make people do that. Their whole approach right now is being very player-centric, very consumer-centric. And so what that means is, hey, you want to play this on PlayStation? If you sign up for Game Pass, we're not going to keep you from playing it. If you have a PlayStation, you love your PlayStation, you don't have the money to buy an Xbox, but you still want to play Halo Infinite or you still want to play these great games, sign up for Game Pass, play it there. Like we're not going to restrict you. And that's, I think the value of that is huge. Again, people are so 
traditionally obsessed with the box. With the box is such a small thing now. The box is such a small piece of the equation that Xbox understands that. And there was a really interesting article that came out about like the 10 most innovative companies in tech right now. And, or 10 most innovative companies in gaming. And Microsoft was number one. And I, I could definitely argue that case. Xbox, in terms of services, in terms of what they're building in long term, they are pushing the industry forward in some really interesting and exciting ways. Obviously, at the end of the day, it comes down to games, and we haven't seen them fully deliver on that promise of having these big, amazing must-play games. But once that falls into place, once those games exist, the suite of services that Xbox have is going to put a lot of pressure on PlayStation. I know we, we look, a lot of people like super invested in the, the community and the industry look at PlayStation as like the pinnacle of success. They are crushing it. They are doing the best and they are doing incredible. They've done, the PS4 was a runaway success. They're, you cannot take that away from PlayStation. PlayStation did an amazing job building up these teams, delivering incredible first party games and selling you on the, the value of having a PlayStation console. But we are in a different time right now. The, the industry is changing. Some people want to ignore that. Some people want to downplay that. But the reality is the industry is changing and PlayStation cannot ignore those changes. And that's why we've seen Jim Ryan come out. That, that interview recently where he was basically admitting that they are trying to reevaluate their business model to make, you know, make PC releases more of a thing. It's because they understand that you know, it takes a lot of money and a lot of resources to make those huge, amazing games that they've been making. And they're not always making the money that they need to make to keep doing that. So they have to expand their possibilities. They can't rely entirely on a console anymore. That's just, unfortunately, not the reality. And it's, again, it sucks to hear as someone who played Super Nintendo, A Link to the Past, very first game I ever played changed my life forever, Get, made me just fall in love with gaming. That game is so important to me as a person and to me as a, as a gamer, if you will. Um, that was on a box. Back then, I couldn't imagine any sort of scenario where you didn't have the box, you didn't put the cartridge in, you didn't have that, that physical contact with the machine and flash forward, you know, 20 some years and that's just, that's not the reality anymore. Things, the times they are at changing, y'all. And Again, I'm not throwing shade at PlayStation. I love PlayStation. Like a lot of people think, you know, because I'm invested in Xbox that I don't I don't like PlayStation or I don't like Nintendo. But I think I do a really good job on the show telling people why I love PlayStation, telling people why I love Nintendo, telling people why I love Xbox and why all three of them are incredibly important and how they can all learn lessons from each other. Bill Spencer constantly talks about why he loves Nintendo and why he's been impressed with their first party suite of exclusives and how they built their platform. So Bill Spencer understands what these people are doing well, and he is not afraid to basically, you know, take inspiration, take ideas from successful companies. And that's what all these companies should be doing. So I, I think internally, despite how people want to present the message about PlayStation or Nintendo, I think PlayStation is looking at Xbox and saying, all right, we came out previously and we said our business model was not structured to have a proper answer to Xbox Game Pass. What can we do to make sure that we do have a business model that caters to an answer to Xbox Game Pass? Because like I said, Xbox Game, Pass, Xbox Game Pass's growth has been impossible to ignore. They are absolutely crushing it without any killer apps. That's the craziest thing. People are just understanding the fundamental value of the service and I think right now there's like 460 or maybe even 560 total games between Xbox Game Pass console and Xbox Game Pass PC. So that's insane. That's insane. You tell somebody right now who doesn't really like care about game. You talk to a friend who's like, hey, you want to play this? I'm like, oh, no, nah, dude, I don't really have 60 bucks. I don't want to pay 60 bucks for this game to play it. And you can say, hey, for 10 bucks, you can play that, this, this game I'm talking about here plus 500 others. And he's like, what? really? And what's the catch? Like, there is no catch. That's it. It's that simple. It's that easy. And the, the messaging of that is so powerful for Xbox. <clears throat> All right. So let's follow up on the old Elder Scrolls versus Fallout debate. I'm seeing a Fallout just slaying in the chat here. Is this true? Are people... Okay. Wait, I'm seeing some Elder Scrolls. Fallout is winning by a landslide, it looks like, in the chat right now. Is that the reality we live in, that Fallout is crushing Elder Scrolls? I don't, I, <clears throat> that is a legit tough question for me because 
I absolutely love Skyrim. And generally speaking, when it comes to RPGs, I, I gravitate towards the, the the fantasy elements. I like I like the magic. I like the monsters. Um, Fallout does have some of that, but I would say generally speaking, Fallout Three in particular, I loved so much more than Skyrim. And that's not to say Skyrim is bad because Skyrim was incredible. I bought it on 360. I bought it on Xbox One. I bought it on Switch. I have it on PC. I love Skyrim. I'm one of the dumb people who bought Skyrim and Resident Evil Four like four or five times. So. I get it. I love it. But generally speaking, I would probably agree with chat right now. And I would say that if I only had to pick one, it would be probably Fallout. Although I was very lukewarm on Fallout 4. I thought Fallout 4 was a very uninspired step forward for the, the franchise. And I was incredibly disappointed with it because it didn't really feel like a sequel and more like a kind of expansion to Fallout 3. And, you know, maybe that's controversial. I know people loved Fallout 4 for being more of the same. But for me, how innovative Fallout 3 was, I wanted something a little bit more from Fallout 4. So I'm hoping that the next Elder Scrolls is kind of that step because, you know, the Elder Scrolls formula has not changed a lot. Um, as much as Skyrim was incredible, um, the Elder Scrolls formula has stayed pretty, pretty consistent for a long time, pretty much since Oblivion. So it's, it's time for a big refresh and a big change. And I'm, I'm ready for it. They need to change that combat up. They need to get, suck me back in. Resell me on Elder Scrolls, Bethesda. Let's go. <clears throat> All right. Who, what, what, uh, let's see if we have any other questions here. But what kind of Game Pass would that be? Only an EA Play kind of subscription makes sense. Sorry, I, that was from BOMO. I'm trying to get the context on that one here. Um, Yodani brings up an interesting point about this being disruptive and it really is, you know, that's a, uh, very kind of cliche tech term. This is disruptive to the industry, but you know, we need to shake things up every once in a while. We need somebody to step in and say, okay, we've been doing it this way for so long, but is there another way? Can we have another option for people in the community and in the industry to basically access games? Does it have to be? People spend all this time and all this money and all this energy investing games, sell it for 60 bucks a pop and sell less than a million copies, less than a million people ever connect or interact with this game. And people spent years of their life with it. Does that have to be the only way? Or can we take some of those great ideas and can we present them at Xbox Game Pass, which instantly opens it up to a huge pool of players. And so you don't have that $60 hurdle keeping you from checking out this game. The medium is a prime example. I don't think a lot of people would pay $50 for the medium. I love it. It's a great game. I could justify a $50 price tag if someone was interested in buying it a la carte. But at the end of the day, like that opened up the medium to so many more people. And it got so many more people talking about it. And it got so many more people looking at Bloober Team. So I think for them, that, that has been a huge kind of boon of success for, for that developers. More people had access to this game that otherwise probably would not have sold more than a, a few million copies at most, even with the Xbox marketing. I, I am excited that even outside of Xbox Game Pass, that the Medium team was able to basically recoup development and marketing costs in like a day. And I think a lot of that kind of energy and excitement comes from like, hey, this is launching in Game Pass. This is like kind of sort of an Xbox, or it is an Xbox exclusive, not a first party one. There's a lot of energy and excitement behind that. And that kind of word of mouth, even if you didn't, you know, play it in Game Pass, you had people in Game Pass who played it and said, yo, this is awesome, play it. And then you had people buying it because of that. So it's it's really powerful and it really is, to Adani's point, uh, disruptive to the industry. <laughs> maybe I'm old fashioned, maybe, I, or, sorry, maybe I'm not old fashioned, maybe I'm, you know, a little heartless or however you wanna look at it, however you wanna spin it. You have, you know, people who say that Xbox Game Pass is killing the industry and developers aren't making any money and, we know that's not true. We have a lot of data to show that that is not true. Uh, you don't have people coming back to Game Pass. You don't have people putting out one game in Game Pass, not making any money, feeling terrible about it, and then putting another game in Game Pass. You don't have, that's not a reality that ever would exist. And we see that time and time again. Bloober Team, Fallout, big, big publishers and developers are, are seeing the value of Game Pass. And that means they are making money. Big publishers don't, it's all about the dollar dollar bills, you know? 
And so if they're not making money in Game Pass, they're not using Game Pass. They don't care about Game Pass. But when they're seeing that, oh, wow, we, we are making money. People, more people are playing our game. They're either buying more microtransactions. They're telling their friends to buy it. We are making more money because our game is in Game Pass. That sort of value is, in, again, impossible to ignore. Game Pass is impossible to ignore at this point. I had some people kind of blowing up my Twitter feed for saying that. I don't even think, I don't think that's controversial. That is just looking at the industry, looking at the trends, and basically, you know, getting the big picture of where the industry is moving forward. And if you're someone who says that Game Pass doesn't have value, or Game Pass isn't something you're interested in at all, or Game Pass is terrible, you're not, you don't get the big picture. And I'm, again, I'm not trying to attack people. I'm not trying to stir the pot. I'm just saying that big picture wise, Game Pass is incredibly innovative. It is industry changing. And it's going to make a lot of people reevaluate how they present games to customers. Uh, and then you have PlayStation, on the other hand, who is really pushing this idea that they need to sell $70 first party exclusives to make that money back. And so it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. We have Game Pass on the one end of the spectrum, and then we have $70 PlayStation exclusives on the other end. Um, PlayStation obviously understands they need to make more money from their games. They have to. Their games are amazing. They're putting a lot of money and time and effort and energy into them, but they have to make more money. We, we keep hearing about the games like Death Stranding not performing well, uh, or not performing well enough, I should say. These games are not selling poorly, and that's the, that's the thing that people need to understand is we're in a situation where these games need to sell three to five million copies to be, you know, break even. And that's a scary place to be in. When you have a game on that, that scale, when it, when it comes out of the door, it needs to sell millions of copies to break even. And that's, that's a scary place to be as a company. And that puts a lot of pressure on every single release that you put out. And, you know, we have metrics for God of War, Spider-Man selling incredibly well. And that's awesome. That's huge. Uh, but you compare that to Nintendo exclusives, Mario Kart, games like Super Smash Bros. Ultimate selling upwards of 20 to 30 million copies. And the development costs for those are significantly less than a PlayStation exclusive. I can promise you what Nintendo pays to develop an exclusive is so much less than what PlayStation pays to develop an exclusive. So while PlayStation games are selling well, they need to sell more, they need to make more money. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what the internal like business workings of PlayStation look like. I'm sure they're doing fine. They're, they're making, bringing a lot of money in, but they're probably also spending a lot of money. And again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to that interview with Jim Ryan. He's making it transparent that Sony is very invested in making more money. Sony is very invested in figuring out a way to make more money because they have to. They wanna keep delivering these big games, but I think at this point, they've pushed a lot of those big games out of the door and they've seen the return. You know, they have four or five years of development costs. So they go into it, the game sells, they've seen what that return is and they are clearly unhappy with what that return is. Again, this doesn't mean the games are selling poorly, but this means that PlayStation wants more money. They want a piece of the pie, uh, a bigger piece of that pie. Um, so yeah, again, I don't know the inner workings of PlayStation, so I'm not gonna pretend like I know exactly what their financial state is. But I think the way that Jim Ryan has publicly addressed the, the audience in this way, in a way he's really never done before, shows you that Sony needs to change. They are looking at how they can change and that might upset some of their fan base. But again, that one of the most interesting lines from that interview was him talking about how they were af basically afraid to bring PlayStation games to PC because they thought their fan base would revolt and be up in arms and basically super upset with PlayStation as a as a platform and that's that is incredibly interesting to me that playstation's business decisions are being dictated by a very vocal hardcore fan base um and that's for them probably a really tough place to be in because obviously that hardcore fan base has made them successful it's made their brand powerful and so they they can't ignore that as as xbox can't ignore their hardcore fan base but at the same time they really need to expand to a broader audience because that hardcore fan base isn't unfortunately giving them enough money. And again, these companies want to present themselves in a way where they're your buddies and you know they're, they're doing what's best for you, but they also need to do what's best for the business. And that comes down to money at the end of the day. So they want more money. They sounds like they need more money to keep doing what they've been doing and keep delivering exclusives on that scale. <laughs> Uh, 
to my point here, Derek says, I, I would have never played the medium if it was not on Game Pass. I'm a big scaredy cat, so I would have not spent the money on a scary game. Yeah, so stuff like that. People who maybe wouldn't normally buy a horror game or maybe wouldn't buy this style of game or tr checking it out. Me, personally, I, I probably, probably never would have bought Forza Horizon 4. I ended up absolutely loving Forza Horizon 4 and playing for hours and hours and hours. Um, and then Dirt 5, another example. Like, I probably wouldn't have bought Dirt 5 but I've been having a blast playing Dirt 5 with friends. So it's opened me up to more games that, you know, maybe I wouldn't buy, but if it's there and I have the option, let's go. I'm going to play it. Let's boot it up. Let's smash some cars. Let's go. We got Max the Lazy Otaku in here. Andy K. Oh, 213 people, y'all. Let's, let's give it up. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> let's see if we can get to 5,000. That's the goal every stream. We, we haven't hit 5,000 yet. I'm hoping one day that we get there, but oh man. <clears throat> Sorry, just catching up on the chat real quick here. Making sure I'm not missing any any burning questions here. Obviously the super chats are pop obvious obvious for me, so it's easy to catch that, but I do wanna, you know, again, this is a very com community centric episode, so I wanna make sure that I'm engaging and talking with as many people as I can. And then while I'm doing that, let's hit you with the next Big Bethesda, only one exists. Only one can exist. Um, Doom or Wolfenstein, only only one can exist. Let's go. Uh, Mr. Joanna Dark brings an interesting brings up an interesting point about what I was talking about previously with this kind of mentality of the box basically saying that that, that, you know, that's a mindset that is kind of stuck in the 80s. And that's very stuck in the, the early uh, Nintendo versus Sega console wars. You have this idea that you have to have the box. This box is better than this box. But really, we are in a war of platforms right now. And we are in a war of exclusivity right now. You look at all these big streaming services, Paramount Plus, Netflix, HBO, who there's so many, so many video streaming services, and they are all fighting and battling with big exclusives. They're all investing heavily in the killer app. This, this show is, you have to sign up for HBO because of this show. You have to sign up for Netflix because of this show. They all understand the value of those exclusives. And now we are in a position where the, the gaming industries and gaming companies are looking at as well. And they are basic Xbox, especially with this Bethesda news. That is the most direct comparison that I can make. Phil Spencer tells you that these, these games will be exclusive to where game pass exists. So he is telling you that Xbox Game Pass is going to have killer exclusive apps that you need to sign up to Game Pass for. Uh, again, you can still buy them. There's not going to be a scenario where you can't buy these games outright. But what he's trying to, you know, appeal to the like, more casual audience is you have to have Game Pass to play these. You are not going to ignore Game Pass. Game Pass has the best games and is the best place, pl place to play. And, you know, as you know, buzz, buzzwordy marketing as Xbox wants to be the best place, place to play. It, for me, it, it, it's kind of wild to think that Xbox is on track to actually do that. They've been saying that for a while. That's been their goal for a while. But now we are getting to a scenario where Xbox might legitimately be the best place, place to play. Like, not fanboy stuff aside, obviously my, my preference is Xbox. So, you know, I'm trying to pull myself out of that, but I'm just looking at the whole picture, the broad scope of what, what Xbox is doing. And they are legitimately putting themselves in a position where the Game Pass platform, the Xbox platform will be the best place to play and the best value, the best games. And if Xbox delivers that promise and PlayStation hasn't had a proper answer to Game Pass by that point, it's gonna be tough. It's so hard for these companies to compete with Netflix. I use Netflix as the example. They came out of the game gate first. They were uh, quote unquote, very disruptive for the industry. Um, people kind of laughed at them when they said, you know, we're gonna do streaming. You can access all this stuff via streaming. Um, flash forward to now where Netflix is massive. Netflix is on the level of Disney, which hardly any companies in the world can say that. And Netflix is that big. And you have all these other streaming services that are clamoring and fighting and trying to make up ground to, to be Netflix. And really, the only one who successfully competed on that level has been Disney Plus. 
HBO Max have been successful, Hulu's been successful, but they have not been successful on that same level, on that just massive widespread level. And um, yeah, the, the value of that is incredible. The value of that is hard to ignore. So let me catch up on, oh, D okay, Doom. Doom just crushed. I, you know, I thought that one might be a little bit harder because the new Wolfenstein games were so incredible, but so have the new Doom games. Doom 2016 and Doom, Doom Eternal, phenomenal shooters. Absolutely incredible. And that's, and that's another thing. Xbox is going to have the best team of, the best suite of shooters and the best suite of Western RPGs, hands down. It's going to be hard to compete in, the, in that space against Xbox. Xbox has historically always been the shooter box, the shooty box. But, but now, with id and Bethesda, <clears throat> that RPG catalog about to be real thick. About to be really, really thick. And it's, it's going to be wild to think that, you know, in a year or two from now, we're going to have one to two big, massive AAA releases coming out of Xbox. Between Obsidian, between all of Bethesda teams, we're going to have at least one humongous RPG every single year for Xbox. And we're going to get to a cadence where flash forward a year from now, two years from now, we're going to have one big-ish Xbox exclusive every other month. Every, every two to three months, we're going to have one big, massive Xbox exclusive. And that's going to be insane. It's going to be, you know, like when you look at Netflix and you see all this stuff's coming out. It's overwhelming. Like coming to Netflix this month and you see all these exclusives piling on. You're like, wow, I'm going to, I'm going to watch like one of those. There's 20 here. I'm going to watch one. And that's, that's going to be the position that Game Pass is going to be in. But like I said earlier, it's going to be catering to everyone, no matter who you are, what you play, what you like, what you're interested in. Game Pass is going to have it. And that's, insane and um i promise this is not an ad for xbox game pass <laughs> i you know it's it comes across that way but it's one of those services where I, I i'm just legitimately excited about it. i legitimately tell everyone about xbox game pass who hasn't heard about it i've signed up so many of my friends to xbox game pass because it really opens the door to a lot of possibilities i'm a big social gamer for me i love playing games with friends that is how i play most of my games i don't play a ton of single player stuff for myself for the most part because I would rather jump online, get in a party with some friends and experience something together. And then with Game Pass, that opens up that door. You have this game that you want to play. You don't have to tell your friend, hey, we're playing this, go spend 60 bucks. And he's like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm, I'm not going to pay 60 bucks. You can hit him up and say, hey, this is on Game Pass. Let's go. All right, I'm downloading now. I'll be on in 15. Boom, done. That's it. You're playing that game together. No big financial burden, no hurdle. More people are playing multiplayer games. So I think especially when it comes to these big kind of service-based games, these big multiplayer games, Game Pass is such an amazing safety net um, to just let more people experience the game together. Mr. Joanna Dark says, Miles, I just want a new banjo or blinks with FPS boost. <laughs> let us go. I'm, I'm pretty stoked for FPS boost. I, I tried Sniper Elite 4 was blown away because I had played it honestly a few weeks back before the FPS boost kicked in. And I, I don't want to be that guy. I really don't want to be that, that frame rate snob, but at this point I'm spoiled. I'm spoiled with 60 FPS. Once the series X launched and most games were 60 FPS and I have my PC as well. So I've been, you know, games that are not 60 FPS on um, my con my Xbox one X, I was just playing them on PC to get that 60 FPS experience. Now that we're at that point, I'm kind of that guy. And it, it kind of hurts. I still love my Switch. I still play my Switch despite, you know, low res, low frame rate. But I didn't want to play Sniper Elite very long because it was 30 FPS. Flash forward to a few weeks later when that FPS boost came in. And I was playing for hours and hours, at like four or five days in a row with a buddy doing co-op. Because it completely changed the experience for me. Resolution wasn't drastically increased, but that frame rate boost change the game. I was all about it. And once we start seeing more FPS boost titles come through, I'm going to be way more interested in revisiting my library. Even though Evil Within dropped on Game Pass and it's an incredible horror game that people can go and play, it is 540p 30 FPS on Xbox Series X right now, guys. Think about that. Can you It it's it's hard. Again, I I hate being that guy. I hate being the fidelity snob. I hate being the frame rate snob, but Evil Within 1 is 540p, 30 FPS capped, guys. And uh, oh, it, it hurts. 
it hurts to like go back and like replay these games you loved. People Within I loved. Great, incredible game. Rebooting it, and oh my, dude. Oh my God. It's, it's rough and it's sad. And I'm glad Xbox is investing in backwards compatibility in a way that basically lets you re-experience these games you love in a way you've never experienced them before. And 60 FPS alone is, is something that'll make me replay a game. Um, shout out to all my other Dark Souls 3 stands out there. Let's go um, at Jason Ronald on Twitter. Blast him. Say, put Dark Souls 3 FPS boost, you coward. And let's go. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Maybe that's a little hot. Maybe that's a little aggressive. But Dark Souls 3 right now is the one I'm pushing for. I'm standing for. I've been standing for months. Let's Even before FPS boost was officially unveiled, I was adding Bandai and FromSoft saying, hey, what... What's the deal here, guys? Let's talk about this. I have a Series X. I can play Dark Souls 1 in 60 FPS. I can play Dark Souls 2 in 60 FPS. But Dark Souls 3, one of the greatest RPGs of all time and the greatest from software RPG is 900p 30 FPS? On my Series X, this needs to be addressed from software. They ignored me. I was, I was literally... <laughs> There's some like Stan memes, like the Eminem song, like me photoshopped on Stan because I was just doing this joke letter every single week to FromSoft, basically saying like, hey, it's been, it's been three weeks since my first message and I'm starting to lose hope about getting FPS unlocked for Dark Souls 3. And it was a meme. It was a lot of fun. But yeah, if you guys can do me a solid and just harass Jason Ronald on Twitter, that'd be, that'd be ideal. No, don't, don't actually harass him, but kindly send him a message saying, Miles sent me, let's get Dark Souls 3. Let's go. Let's go. Cause I, they, they need to know that that is one of the first games that needs it and needs to happen. <laughs> Ooh, Faisal007 coming with an interesting super chat that I want to touch on. Slap in my hands. Let's go. It is great to see you excited, but let us hope Mikami will use mocap from Ninja Theory. See, that's... What I talked about earlier with Matt Booty talking about how all these teams are getting together and sharing what they're doing. Ninja Theory, pushing the industry with uh, incredible mocap, incredible photorealistic background. That's gonna be the, the next gen showcase of Ninja Theory is they've put a lot of energy and tech into picture perfectly recreated environments and backgrounds. And we're gonna see that with you know Project Mara. We're gonna see that with Hellblade. And then for that team to basically be able to go to, yeah, Shinji, <laughs> Shinji Mikami, butcher that, sorry, and basically show them what they're working on. Say, hey, you're, you're making a horror game? You want some really disgusting, horrifically realistic environments to put your characters in? Here's how we do it. Here's how you can do that with your next game. And that sort of stuff is so exciting to me because, you know, people are only better when they collaborate. As much as people want to take all the credit and, you know, be the person to come up with this idea all, all on their own and have the success to themselves, you can, you're so much better when you collaborate. And you know, that's something I can't stress enough for developers and just you as a person, like you are much better in a team scenario, generally speaking. All of us have individual strengths, weaknesses. And when you can basically talk to someone who can fill in your strengths, you're gonna have a better, better project overall. And that's why this, this whole focus on collaboration with Xbox Game Studios, not to drink the Kool-Aid, but I think is legitimately going to lead to the best games these teams have ever made. Uh, the, the, the water tech for Sea of Thieves, the best water tech that has ever been created. Anyone within Xbox Game Studios can now call up Rare and be like, hey, I'm doing this segment with water tech. What's your secret? What'd you guys do here? And they can basically take that Sea of Thieves water tech and implement it in their own games. And Coalition, incredible multiplayer studio. They are unreal masters. What they were able to do with Gears 5 on the Xbox One X, absolutely insane. Dynamic resolution on Gears 5 is the best that I have ever seen on any game. And that team has so much technical wizardry that they can kind of lend to these other studios to say like, hey, how do we optimize our game? Like our game is great fundamentally, mechanics are working great, but we're having some issues with performance. How are you guys able to have that lock 60 regardless of what's going on in screen? Coalition can be like, all right, here's our secrets. Here's what we do to make sure that, you know, despite all the chaos, that your, your experience stays fluid and you don't even notice the, the dip in graphical quality. And we don't even have DLSS incorporated in the console yet. So once that happens, especially with the Coalition, Gear 6 is going to be just 
eyeball melting. I, I can't wait to see what the coalition does with gear six because that studio is so incredibly talented when it comes to the fundamental elements of unreal. Super chat from PC game boy. I feel like game pass is going to cause more competition on PC too. Very interesting point. Valve has got to have an answer to it, which I welcome more com competition on PC, the better. That is an incredible point as well. Yes. This isn't just out. This isn't just the console space. This isn't just people, you know, on their phones. This is PC. More PC players are recognizing that, oh, wow, I can play these games on my incredibly high-end PC and I don't have to pay $60, $70 a pop. I can just sign up for Game Pass and I can play Halo. I can play Gears. I can play Forza. I can play Sea of Thieves. I can play all these amazing games on my amazing PC for a low cost. And yeah, we have no, I mean, I guess I'll pose this question to you guys. Is there anyone on PC who has... A, an answer that's even close to Game Pass right now. And I don't mean that, you know, to downplay any other services. I'm just, I'm, I'm racking my brain right now to see if there are any, are any companies that have a good kind of answer to that. And I'm struggling to come up with one. Mr. Joanna Dark says, Miles, you are the bearer of the Elden Ring. You will get your FPS boost for Dark Souls 3. I better, all right? I better, Jason Ronald. I, I come off really aggressive, but really, I'm, I'm, I'm generally a nice guy, okay? <clears throat> and we got Yo know, Donnie coming in with some real-world experience. He says, as someone who was a U.S. Navy sailor, I can say that Sea of Thieves water tank is as close, to as, <laughs> as, close as it gets in a video game. Strong words from someone who has that real-world world experience, someone who's been on a boat for hours and hours and hours. I've really only virtually been on a boat for hours, like, I think 700 hours now in Sea of Thieves. Um, so yeah, it's. I remember booting up Sea of Thieves for the first time and just being in total awe of the water. I couldn't stop staring at it. Seeing the foam splash, like watching the waves, watching how your ship reacts to the waves. It, it, that was, for me, the biggest kind of next-gen moment of, of this last generation was the water tech in Sea of Thieves, which, I don't know, kind of says, says something a little bit about the innovations of this this generation but that for me was so exciting and so cool and i want more stuff like that i want more moments like that and i think you know going to the in this generation especially as we have more options for kind of ai i think ai and physics are going to be the biggest kind of ways that gaming changes and caters to us and makes the experience more immersive i think you know we're going to see a lot of advancements in ai that are going to be like wow like i don't because when you play stuff like Hitman, when you play stealth games, it's really easy to cheese the AI. Like the AI is very primitive, very basic, and that's be just because historically we haven't had the processes to be able to have more advanced AI. Now that that's opened up some possibilities, um, we're going to see some really cool stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still doing some digging to see what the v validity of this is. So again, just, just know that, like, I don't know if this is true at all right now, I'm still digging, but I've had some people hitting me up about a potential uh, Rockstar tech demo, uh, a potential Rockstar tech demo that might be showcased, I assume for Grand Theft Auto 6, that has incredibly advanced AI that is region-based. So I've heard of this tech demo where in different zones across the city and across this world, AI is coded and programmed a specific way to kind of cater to that, that region. So we have people already, hypothetically, again, I, I don't know if this is true. I'm still doing some digging, but we have some people looking at how they can improve AI and looking at how they can push AI forward and to have this kind of really unique experience where the NPCs in the zone are unique to that zone because of the way they're programmed is, is really interesting. And I think that could open up some really incredible possibilities for a, an overall more immersive experience. Uh, geezer1916, welcome to the member tier. <laughs> welcome to the member tier. Really appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks again for all the support, everyone. In regards to the, you know, competition to game pass on PC, Mr. Joanna Dark says, that, yeah, NVIDIA is what GeForce now, I guess is an option as well, but is the, do you, 
I need to do some more research on GeForce now. I've only used it like once or twice. Is there a huge catalog of games or is that just your streaming games you own? That my understanding was you were streaming games that you own. There isn't necessarily a, a catalog that you have access to for paying one monthly fee. But again, let me know if I'm wrong there. Rick Teodoro with an amazing comment that I 100% agree with here. You guys in the chat are awesome. Chatterday's community is the best. Yes. I'm, again, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not being cheesy or corny when I say that, you know, hanging out with everyone in this chat on Saturday is one of my favorite things of the week. Um, sometimes there's more stuff to talk about than others, but everyone in the chat poses great questions, is really engaged with the show, and that keeps things flowing, keeps things exciting, and keeps me, you know, looking forward to every Saturday. So again, I really appreciate it. Really, really genuinely appreciate everyone who hangs out and watches the show live. Again, if you're watching after the fact, still appreciate that. Still hope you're enjoying. I try to, you know, cater the responses and how I interact with the chat in a way that makes it so it's not awful to watch after the fact. But I do encourage people, if you have the time, if you're available, to catch the show live, because that is, you know, the most fun. <clears throat> um, Erfkithy Grays with this $5 super chat. Appreciate that. Uh, Microsoft has been incompetent the last seven years in creating their own new exclusives, so they've had to buy all these studios. It's really sad. That is a take. That is definitely a take that you are entitled to. Um, I, you know, I was, I've been pretty open about Xbox being unable to deliver must-play games. Xbox objectively hasn't had a huge suite of must-play exclusives over the over the last several years. In, in more recent years, we we have a better idea of what that's going to look like moving forward, and they're obviously correcting that issue. Um, but the the whole argument that they've had to buy all these studios to you know compete, um, the same thing can be said of Sony. Sony bought studios, Sony bought Insomniac, Sony bought Na Naughty Dog, Sony bought all of these, all, most of their premier studios are ones that they've bought and nurtured and curated and catered. And Xbox is doing that now. That is the, the course that Xbox is on. Like I said, Phil Spencer looks at what PlayStation is doing, what Nintendo is doing. Phil Spencer understands how successful Sony has been acquiring these studios and then building them up. And that is exactly what Xbox is doing right now. They just haven't had the, the lead time that PlayStation has with a lot of these teams. So we're going to start seeing that moving forward. So for you to say that this is really sad, is, is it, was it sad when Sony was doing that? Because Xbox right now is modeling their, their exclusive approach to Sony's. So as someone who loves PlayStation games, who loves PlayStation exclusives, I would say you should be excited about this. Because Phil Spencer's not ignoring that. They're not just trying to, to buy studios and put a band-aid on it. They're trying to, you know, get these partnerships built up that will lead to those incredible exclusive games that Sony has built. Um, but to say that them buying is sad is just, does not prove your point. Because th then you are also saying Sony's approach is sad. <clears throat> All right, JD Gamer with a $2 super chat. So Microsoft is looking for publishers. Any guesses who? Ooh, we doing the publisher guessing game? We did this with uh, Snowbike Mike. That was last week. God, it felt like an eternity. This week's been so massive that last week just felt like an, it, it feels like it's been months since last week, which is, which is crazy, which is exciting. Um, any guesses who? Okay, so guesses. Do we want wild guesses? Just throwing out stuff that I want? Or do you want more, you know, objective kind of, uh, industry-based speculation, because I'll give you both ju just for funsies here. So wild speculation, what I want to see is Capcom. If, again, I talked about this at the beginning of the show, the value of Capcom, that Capcom would add to Xbox Game Pass would be absolutely ridiculous. Resident Evil, Monster Hunter World, Devil May Cry, all these incredible franchises in Xbox Game Pass under the Xbox umbrella would be absolutely industry-shaking. I think arguably more than Bethesda. I think if Xbox came out and said, hey, we're buying Capcom, that would absolutely shatter the, new, the news for that entire year. Like you thought the Bethesda exclusivity talks were spicy. Whoa, mama, you wait till you would. <laughs> I can't even imagine what the Capcom exclusivity talks would be like. So if I had to you know, pick one that I want Xbox to get and one that I think would be the most beneficial for Xbox's you know, 
vision to have Xbox Game Pass be this massive beacon and be this massive service, Capcom. The value there is undeniable. The strength of their IP is absolutely incredible. And let's let's go. Let let's go. Let's make that happen. So that's just wild speculation. <clears throat> Some more realistic ones. When we're talking about Xbox is trying to basically increase their appeal in Japan. They're trying to build up their you know, their status in Japan. They're trying to basically have some more Japanese partnerships and some more notoriety with Japanese audiences. I think, you know, the talks of Sega are, are probably realistic. There's probably at the very least been some really serious conversations about this happening, potentially more. I think probably I would say Sega is the most realistic moving forward. If, if we're looking at it in terms of what this could do for Xbox, what this could do for Phil's goals to boot bolster their Japanese presence. I think Sega is a legitimately realistic option for them and probably one that has some conversations that are more serious than we we imagine. If if I'm picking one. I also think Bandai Namco is another really cool potential publisher for Xbox as well. They've been doing a ton of collaborating with Bandai Namco as of late um with, you know, a lot of the with Game Pass in particular. There's been a ton of Bandai games in Game Pass, which is always a huge metric for, you know, the future. You look at the companies who've had these successful, like successful, I guess, launches, successful experiences with Game Pass. Bethesda, prime example. Uh, Phil Spencer talked about how Bethesda got Game Pass. And that was one of the main reasons that they, you know, acquired them. That's why they partnered with them because they understood the value of Game Pass. And once more big publishers understand that, Bandai especially, Sega right now with all of the Yakuza's, once they see like wh what this does for their games and their service, you know, they'll get on board. And so I think the, the, the most likely publishers right now are the ones who most invested in Game Pass because Xbox Game Pass is the most important pillar of Xbox's business strategy right now. And they are not going to pick, they're not going to take on anyone who doesn't understand that, who doesn't get that. So Bandai, Sega, I would say are, are very likely. Or I shouldn't say very, I would say they are the most likely if I'm giving out predictions as to who I think will um, be acquired next. I got to be careful after that whole from software thing uh, and how I word it. So yes, those are two. I'll give you those two. Do what you will with that information. That's not confirmed, but there. <clears throat> Faisal007, another super chat. Dude, you got three back to back? Y'all killing it. Um, how is the shoulder now? And I need a tunic now. Tunic, yes. Tunic is an Xbox exclusive this year. Let's go. People are sleeping on that. I think that game's going to be phenomenal. I, I'm hoping that's the next cuphead for Xbox. Indie darling that everyone is obsessed with, everyone talks about. It explodes, starts on Xbox, goes to Switch, goes everywhere. E everyone loves it. I'm hoping that's what Tunic is. That's what I want to see from Tunic. Tunic looks amazing. As for the shoulder... It's doing a lot better. Look at this. Well, look at this. Hands over my head. Oh, it's a little sweaty. Ignore that. Uh, <laughs> hands over my head. Feeling a lot better. Um, yeah, doing good. Still have the metal plate. Still is a bit sore. Um, you know, maybe I'll post a wicked picture of my scar on Twitter one of these days in case, in case you all want to see it. No. Erfgethy <laughs> uh, Grays. $2 super chat again. Uh, I hope Sony buys Rockstar. I, it sounds like... You're a, you're a big Sony fan, but I do appreciate you supporting the channel uh, with these super chats. Seems like your intent is maybe to stir the pot a little bit with some of these. And, you know, I appreciate opening up the conversation. Um, I think Rockstar is one of those ones that I don't know that anyone's going to buy. I don't know that anyone wants to pay what that price tag would look like. Again, we talked about that with Snowbike Mike as to what, you know, Rockstar would involve. Basically, you'd have to buy take two. To get to get Rockstar, and what that would involve would be absurd. You, the Bethesda amount was insane. The 7.5 billion for Bethesda was incredible. But Rockstar can say we have Grand Theft Auto, which has made more more money than any piece of media ever, and consistently makes a ton of money. Um, so that price tag would be absurd. And is someone like Sony going to pay 20 billion? Is someone like Microsoft even going to pay 20 billion? I don't know. I really don't know. It would be wild, but I really have a tough time imagining Sony, especially right now, given their recent statements on how they're trying to shift their, you know, their focus. 
I don't see them dropping that price. I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't see Xbox dropping that price either. That is huge. That is insane. It's, I can't even wrap my mind around $7.5 billion. So trying to wrap my mind around a rock star acquisition, it's, it's too much. The numbers are too big. My brain can't even process that many numbers. <laughs> Another super chat from JD Gamer uh, with Capcom. Um, fighting, fighting games and action games. Sweet. You get fighting and action games. Yes, um, Capcom has Street Fighter. I didn't even mention Street Fighter. What am I doing? Street Fighter, Resident Evil, Monster Hunter. There are some, again, there are some historically PlayStation-centric IP in, in a, an acquisition here. So again, I think in terms of like pulling people into the Xbox ecosystem, I really can't re stress enough how big Capcom would be. Capcom would be insane. Let's go. Let's will it into existence, people. And again, shout out to the over 200 people joining us. If you're new, really appreciate you taking, taking the time to hang out in our little Chatterdays community here. We, we always have a ton of fun. Appreciate everyone taking time out of their Saturday morning, evening, middle of the night to uh, hang out. I, re I really genuinely do. Eagles fan 76 with a $2 super chat. Clue if the next controller is orange at Sega. I've seen that conspiracy going around. You know your boy loves conspiracy theory. You know your boy loves going down the rabbit hole. Um, so yes, we've seen the blue, which a lot of people were like, oh, the blue controller, that means Xbox is buying Sega, let's go. And then now we saw the red. Knuckles, wait a second, Sonic Knuckles, blue and red, and then if we had an orange, Sonic Knuckles and Tails? Sega confirmed, let's go. I, <laughs> I've seen that conspiracy running around and it's fun. I love that. I love that that would be the way that they announced they're getting Sega is by releasing a series of Sonic the Hedgehog themed controllers over the course of the year and then going into next year, they're like, hey, by the way, um, Sega, Sega's part of Xbox, let's go. Here's a trailer for the new reboot of Sonic the Hedgehog, let's go. Like stuff, again, I love conspiracy theories. It's fun to go down the rabbit hole, talk about the wild possibilities. Uh, it's also important to keep yourself a little grounded and realize, you know, that might not be the reality, as incredible as that would, would be and as incredible as we want it to be. Um, but yes, I've seen that. And if it's, a, orange is my favorite color. So even if it's completely unre unrelated to Sega, day one buy for me. Day one, no questions, I'm buying an orange Xbox controller. Gaming Addict, supporting the channel. What up, homie? I'm gonna be, uh, join I'm gonna be joining the Lords of Gaming here uh, next, next weekend as well. So um, he says, hit that like button, guys. Let's go. Hit that. <laughs> Again, I talked about this earlier. I'm, try I'm trying to feed the algorithm. The algorithm on YouTube wants the likes. It wants the, the comments. They want the shares. So again, if you could do that, really appreciate it. If you are enjoying the show, if you are hanging out, yeah, just take a quick second to hit that like button. Again, I don't like harping on it because it feels cheesy, feels cliche, but I I'm, I'm just trying to feed the beast here. I'm, I'm at the mercy of the, the, the YouTube algorithm here. So I appreciate that. Lars, is this, what's DKK? I don't need to know the conversion, but what currency is DKK? 100 of these, whatever this currency is. It all comes down to whether Microsoft can make money on Game Pass. One thing is to have a lot of game studios that makes games, but quality com games cost a lot of money to make. Incredible point. I think we're gonna see a diverse slate of games from Xbox Game Studios team. It's not gonna be only exclusively massive AAA games. That's not gonna be the reality. We are gonna have some cool, smaller scale AA games kind of mixed in from Xbox Game Studios where it's a smaller team working on a cool little side project. Look at Grounded. Grounded is a great example of something like that. Not a massive AAA release, but still a really genuinely great, amazing idea that touches on an established survival genre and takes it and makes it its own. I absolutely love what the team is working on with Grounded, but that's not a AAA game. That's 14 people making that. So. We're gonna see stuff like that as well. They are gonna focus on probably a smaller slate of these massive games like Halo Infinite, Fable, The Perfect Darks, the ones that need to come out of the gate and just really deliver. Um, but you're right, those cost a lot of money. And the more people they can get in, subscribe to Xbox Game Pass, the less stress that money has on the teams making these games. Because if you have a safety net of, let's say, Xbox gets 50 million people subscribed to Game Pass here in the next year. Let's give them 12 months. 
So I think we're going to see this holiday season, we're going to see the, the numbers get up to, I would, I would estimate at least 30 million. By the end of, once Halo Infinite launches, as long as Halo Infinite launches this year, I think we're going to see Xbox Game Pass subs surpass 30 million by the end of 2021. So let's give Xbox one full year from now to get to 50 million. 50 million Game Pass subscribers. Let's say they're there. That gives those companies a lot of wiggle room when it comes to the, the, the traditional financial stresses of game development. Catching up on the JD Gamer just cr my, JD Gamer, Faisal, Mr. Joanna Dark. Super Chats just coming in hot and heavy. And I appreciate it. I, I really do. What single studio would you most. JD Gamer. My dude. Uh, what, what single studio would you most like Microsoft to buy? Some of you already know. Some of y'all already know this answer. This is not going to come as a surprise to a lot of people in here, but from software. From Software is one of my, f they've created the formula that has just resonated me with me more than really anything in the last few decades. They took Castlevania Symphony of the Night with, and they, and with Dark Souls 1, they made a 3D Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which basically has been one of my favorite games of all time, still is one of my favorite games of all time. From a design perspective, Castlevania Symphony of the Night is so important to gaming. And From Software, they, know, they, they love Castlevania. It's obvious when you play Dark Souls that they love Castlevania, especially Symphony of the Night. And Dark Souls was the, the catalyst of the 3D action RPG formula that so many people try to replicate now because it's, it's incredible. What they were able to achieve and create is, was so unique, so groundbreaking, and I just don't get tired of it. I replay all the Dark Souls games consistently, Bloodborne, Sekiro, I love them all. So when it, when it comes to a single studio, if I could make it happen, if I had a blank check, if I could call up Phil and be like, hey, let's go. It's from software. Hands down, no questions asked. That would be my number one pick. John Brown says Capcom equals game over. Like I said, people think, people think Bethesda was a big deal. People think Bethesda stirred up the industry, stirred the pot. Capcom I can't even imagine the, how awful the internet discourse would be in some circles if Xbox announced that, that they were acquiring Capcom. I really can't stress that enough. <clears throat> Valorian asked, Miles, will you be bringing Chatterdays to Spotify? Um, interesting question, yes. Um, Homie Jez is kind of going to be helping me out on the back end as we see the show, sh um, show grow, as we get some you know, more incredible guests and a lot of cool features and as our audience grows, I understand that more people want more consistent timestamps, which I'm also working on, and people want audio only options on, you know, stuff like Spotify. So yes, Jez is going to be helping me out in the background to get the audio versions on these other platforms. I'll keep you guys up to date once we get a more solid plan. Um, my, my work schedule right now is really packed as it is. So yeah, I'm kind of holding on Jez a little bit to kind of help me out. Help me out and give give you guys you know more ways to access this. And I'll be super transparent with you guys as well. Uh, the main reason we're doing this show on YouTube versus other platforms is we are using this as a way to kind of grow our YouTube channel. The Windows Central Gaming YouTube channel for me is like my metric of success. How I'm graded in the company is based on the metrics of the Windows Central Gaming channel. Um, you know, I'm not afraid to tell you guys that I want to be just open and transparent. So the reason that I do this on YouTube and the reason I push the YouTube and the live is because one, the interaction is super fun. I, that is for me, the, the catalyst of the show was a, a way to have interaction with, with the community and with the audience. And two, just frankly, trying to boost the Windows central gaming sub subscriber count, um, trying to get that up last year. Again, I talked on, talked about this, maybe the last episode, but we gained almost 20,000 subscribers last year, which is huge. We started the year with like 2,700 subs. It was just some side thing that they were giving me like one or two video projects a month on. And we were just kind of, you know, doing it on the side where we could squeeze it in, in terms of budget. And then, you know, starting in May, we really kind of started to say, hey, maybe we can do something with it. So in May, I think we had less than 4,000, 3,500. And so from May to the end of December, we got 21, almost 21,000 subs, a little over 20,000 subs in like that, that period of time. Um, so that was incredible. Like seeing that growth, seeing all the support has been awesome. 
And I really appreciate everyone who shares and you know shares the kind words about what we're doing over here because I put a lot of time in and energy and effort into producing you know kind of elevated YouTube videos and it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. So I you know seeing the nice comments and seeing people share the videos it it, it means a lot because I I do spend you know 15, 20 hours on video sometimes and it's it's nice to get the the reassurance that what we're doing is is connecting with people. So again. Okay. Try not to be cheesy. Try not to be corny, but it, it means a lot to me. Uh, Faisal 007 says, "Give Mikami Dino Crisis or <laughs> any oh, Animushi." What is, what is that other one? Oh, uh, I mean, <laughs> you spelled it wrong. I'm saying it wrong. Uh, the Samurai Capcom thing. That Samurai Capcom thing the resident evil thing i know what you're talking about hopefully everyone else knows because i'm butchering that hard but yes dino crisis would be so great to see come back i know that's one that people just want to see so badly because that idea was always too big for its time i felt like like it was really cool to take the resident evil formula throw dinosaurs in the mix and just let it run wild but i want to see photorealistic just insanely detailed scary dinosaurs in a modern game um, you know, we have Second Extinction as kind of an example of that, but that's more of a Left 4 Dead formula. But I want a game that reminds you how terrifying it would be if dinosaurs actually existed today and how ferocious and how weak you would be as just a, a lonely human trying to take on a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Like that, a Tyrannosaurus Rex is so much scarier than a zombie. Zombie you can run away from. Zombie you can deal with. A T-Rex though? Oh man. Good luck. Godspeed to you. <laughs> Oh, and then we got Earthgay giving me the super chat for the, the quick question. EKK is Danish. Oh, cool. Danish. Danish currency. Appreciate that. And appreciate you taking the time to super chat the, uh, the info there. I, I see all the different currencies come in, and I don't, you know, I appreciate, I don't really care what the amount is. Like, it all means a lot to me, but it's interesting to see the different currencies. Just because, I don't know, it's interesting. All right, JD Gamer says, I have to ask for another single studio because From Software is part of Katakawa Corporation. And if you could pick one genre to improve on Xbox, what would it be? Another single studio? Bloober. Bloober team, let's go. I'm picking one definitely 100% independent developer that does not tie to any parent company. If you hit me with the, the specifics here. Hit me with some intense technicalities. Bloober team. I love what they do. I love horror games. And I want that team to have all the resources they need to kind of deliver some of these big grand ideas that they have. So Bloober team, let's go. If I can't have From Software, if you're gonna come in here and take From Software from me, uh, Bloober team, for sure. And one genre that Xbox could improve. One genre that Xbox could improve for me personally um, would be, uh, I'd, that is tough. That is really tough. Xbox, I feel, has a pretty good slate of diverse games. Obviously, they have a lot of shooters. They have a lot of racing games. Um, I would say, if I had to pick one, it would be JRPGs. I will be fully transparent that I am not nearly as big into JRPGs as I once was. So I probably wouldn't even play a lot of big Xbox JRPGs if I'm being fully transparent. It's just my tastes have shifted. When I was younger, I played every Final Fantasy. I put Legend of Mana is still one of my favorite RPGs of all time. Absolutely love it. Used to really love and connect with JRPGs. I want to see somebody come out and kind of reinvent what that formula is. I know games like Final Fantasy 15 tried, try to come out and like re reimagine and reshape what that means, what a Final Fantasy game means. But the traditional kind of he super story focused, super traditional story with turn-based combat, what we kind of know and love as a as a JRPG, I think needs a big refresh. And so if somebody could come out and basically be like, this is the new JR, this is what JRPGs are now. And if Xbox was tied to that, I would be incredibly excited. But that's one area where they get a lot of criticism. They don't, we don't have Persona. Persona is huge. People love Persona. There's a lot of massive JRPGs that just don't come to Xbox at all. And Phil Spencer gets that. And I think that's why he's really trying to invest and kind of correct their, their appeal in Japanese audiences. <laughs> Um, humdrum dog with a super chat as well. Two dollars. Hope they buy Sega. Tired of Atlas neglecting us. Yeah, I was just talking about that. 
Atlas is a big pillar of of that kind of JRPG movement. Persona is is probably the closest thing that we've seen to that. This is what JRPGs are now and what they can be. That's probably the closest we, thing we've seen in a while. So that would be huge. That would bolster Xbox's appeal to a wide audience because traditionally those games and those franchises are tied to, let's be realistic, PlayStation. So Xbox, you know, they want to pull people from all different pools. They want to pull PlayStation gamers in. They want to pull Nintendo gamers in. They want to pull PC players in. So they are working incredibly hard to have an incredibly diverse portfolio. And that's why they're buying these PC-focused studios, RPG-focused studios, and shooter-focused studios is because they know, you know, what people play and what people like, and they want to make sure they have something that offers that and gives that to players. Eternal Umbra with the $10 super chat. Looks like it's a really sweet one. Uh, Miles, my dude, the reason you all grew so much is because you all reported Xbox news fairly compared to most in gaming media. You also interact with us regularly as fans. Never change. Appreciate that. Thank you. Again, we're, we're in the kind of like a, an interesting position because we, you know, we have, we have the YouTube channel and that's, I'm, we're trying to bridge the gap between, you know, like a, I guess more of like a personality kind of audience interaction based thing and more of a traditional journalism outlet. Um, because Windows Central is a very traditional journalism outlet. Um, but, you know, everyone on that team loves gaming. We, we, that's why I get so many people from the industry, so many developers on the show and do so many interviews is because I love gaming. I want to know everything about the process. And I think it's really important for, you know, fans and players to understand what that process looks like and understand that, you know, despite the the business element of of game development and publishers that... Everyone involved is doing it because they love gaming. There's there's really not a lot of nefarious reasons to be involved in the industry. Even on the journalism side, you have people who criticize some journalists and say they only do it to like stir the pot and they they hate gamers and nobody goes into game journalism because they dislike gaming. They do it because they love gaming. And that's just the reality. So you, there is this conflict there where people, you know, gamers and journalists kind of fight back and forth because, you know, sometimes people have bad takes or some people have opinions that are wrong. And I don't think a lot of that comes from nefarious reasons. At least I like to think that. And I hope that's not the case. Some of it maybe is. But yeah, we do it because we love gaming. And, you know, I love talking to all everyone here who loves gaming as well. And it's, it's fun. Talking about gaming for me is incredibly fun. And that's why I do it. And that's why you guys watch the show. That's why you guys watch shows like Xbox Two, um, RDX, is because you love gaming. Um, obviously, we we slant towards the Xbox side, but I've had you know segments dedicated to why I love PlayStation. I put Randall Thor on blast because he's one of the the big industry Xbox figures who complains about Nintendo most vocally. So I put him on blast on the show in a fun way. It was it was lighthearted about why he tries to downplay the value of Nintendo. So gaming is awesome. All three, PlayStation, Nintendo, and Xbox, are doing something incredible right now. And this generation, probably more than the last few, has the potential to be the most exciting in terms of like what's on the horizon, what this could mean. And it's it's just an exciting time to talk about games. That's it's that's that's why I do it. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm just spending my Saturdays with you guys, because I love it. <laughs> oh, Mr. Joanna Dark, in terms of brings up an interesting point. In terms of you know what genres xbox is struggling in by saying single player narrative driven experiences and platformers uh yes the single player narrative driven experience is something playstation has just been dominating they've perfected that formula that, that's been their bread and butter and you know some people try to downplay that too I'm like all playstation games are like the same formula and i mean that formula works why do you think marvel movies consistently do well it's pretty much the same formula action comedy and people watch it every single time. Even if it's you know a, a def different setting, different theme, same formula, people watch it, people love it because it works. And so you can't really fault PlayStation do for doing that. They've, they've done it really well. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping Xbox bridges that gap with games like Hellblade 2. I think that's gonna be their first big test in terms of like, this is a single player narrative game from Xbox Game Studios. This is what we can offer. This is what we're bringing to the table. And I really think Hellblade 2 is gonna come out and just absolutely deliver. They are putting so much energy and effort and love into making sure that Hellblade 2 is their pinnacle. Like they want it to be the last of us. They want it to be one of those games everyone talks about, no one can ignore. And I really hope that they, they, they deliver. 
Yo, Donnie with the $2 super chat says, imagine Killer Instinct versus Capcom versus Marvel. Whoa, dude, slow, slow down here. I can't process all that at once. That is, that's incredible. That idea to me, whew, let's do that. And then let's have Xbox develop its Smash Bros clone. Super Xbox Bros Ultimate, let's go. I like where your head's at, Yudani. I, I like that idea a lot. Let's go. Um, I did, that thought had never even crossed my mind, and now I'm, I'm trying to take that all in, because that's, that's a lot. That is a lot to process, but I like it. I, I like that idea. Let's go. Uh, super chat from Opposable Thumbs. Happy to like and subscribe. Love the positive attitude and level-headed chat. Great show, especially you and Snowbike Mike. Appreciate that. Mike is an awesome dude. We're going to be doing some more stuff together here in the near future. Um, cause yeah, we, we, even after our extended three hour podcast, which is the longest episode of Xbox chatter days we've done by like an hour. Uh, we ended up talking for like 45 minutes after still just like hanging out after talking about a lot of different stuff. So him and I are um, going to be doing some more stuff and just in general, I'm just gonna be hanging out with Mike in general, just playing games. That dude's super nice, super cool. And, um, just genuinely, genuinely loves gaming. And that's, there's so many, we talked about that when he was on. There's so many people in this industry and in this community that just love gaming, love talking about it, and they're just really fun and positive. And that's what it's all about. We can, we can go back and forth and say, oh, this is better than this, or this is better than this. But, you know, you can get lost in the negativity really easily. And I don't want to come across as, you know, just some Xbox hype, hype man. I'm not afraid to criticize Xbox. I'm not afraid to criticize any developer or publisher on areas where they need to improve. Um, but at the same time, like I don't want to just be lost in the negativity, obsessed with the negativity, because then it's, it's hard to see the positives. When you start going down that rabbit hole and you get lost in all the negatives, it, at least for me, it, like it, it's hard to pull myself out of that and kind of look at, look at the bright side, I guess, if you will. And it's not, you know, all dandelions and roses. There are, you know, dark sides of the industry and there are people doing really bad things unfortunate things to people in the industry developing games and that stuff needs to be called out for sure we can't ignore the you know people basically being used and abused to make video games video games should be fun developing video games should be fun playing video games should be fun and talking about video games should be fun and if there's ever a disconnect in that formula where that's not the case that needs to be addressed there video games are entertainment they should be fun we shouldn't have people like basically having their lives ruined. You hear horror stories of people who went into the industry with good intentions, got chewed up and spit out and just have no interest in the industry at all because they saw the, the, you know, the dark side of that. And that stuff to me is heartbreaking because I, like I talked about in this episode countless times, people get into gaming because they love it. They love games. And I, I don't like to imagine scenarios where people stop loving games. I don't ever see a world, even when I'm like a 70 year old dude, just chilling on the couch, I'll probably be playing my switch super switch pro four at that point or what, whatever it is. But you know, it's, it's sad that that happens. Um, earth get the, I'm sorry if I'm butchering it. it's E R F G T H Y G R E A S so has a super chat. So earth key earth, get the earth, get the grays. <laughs> Xbox needs a cinematic uncharted type game. Yeah, um, Uncharted is awesome. I think Indiana Jones obviously is the, the most obvi obvious parallel there. I think that's gonna be probably the, the closest thing you're gonna see to an Xbox Uncharted game. Um, and I'm really excited to see what Todd Howard does with that. I'm really excited to see some of these, you know, legacy franchises get a big budget because yeah, we've, we've seen a lot of really bad, mediocre licensed games over the years where they bank on the name more than they bank on the quality of the team developing it. So they give these up and coming teams incredibly small budgets to try to make a game with a, with a license. So I'm excited to see, you know, these licenses get the care and love that they deserve. So Indiana Jones getting a, a AAA budget, that's exciting. That is something to be excited about. <laughs> Mr. Joanna Dark with the $5 super chat. If you could create a mashup JRPG, what Xbox mascots would you include and in what type of battle system? Oh, a mashup JRPG oh, with Xbox mascots. Okay, okay. Give me just a quick second to think about this. I'm gonna tell you the battle system that I want already. I already know the battle system. 
and it's going to be Final Fantasy Tactics. Final Fantasy Tactics is the foundation for this battle system. Now, what Xbox mascots would I want? Ooh, that is a, that is a tough one. Okay, I'm going to go with... I'm going to go with a Halo RPG. A Halo, a Halo themed RPG in the style of Final Fantasy Tactics. Super heavy influence on an engaging story. Super character focused and super class based. So every member within your squad in this Halo Final Fantasy Tactics style RPG has a specific skill tree and a specific set of skills that they can use in these different turn-based scenarios. And you are fighting all the different monsters and aliens of, of various Halo rings. So you're like a task force that's tasked to go to these different Halo rings and do research on, on the, the life forms there. Um, yeah, spitballing, throwing that out there. That's let's, I'll throw that out, out into the world and see what happens there. But that's, that's what I got for you. Um, Faisal 007, another super chat, just killing it. Jeez. In Japan, I guess the best approach is to lock down IPs such as Zone of Enders, Metal Gear Solid, and Silent Hill and try to have more IPs instead of companies. Yeah, a lot of uh, like legacy Japanese franchises right now don't have studios tied to them. So it is more of a battle of getting that IP. Konami criminally is sitting on so many incredible IP. Silent Hill, Castlevania, for example, Metal Gear Solid. They have a amazing pool of IPs that they are just letting rot. And I really hope that, you know, somebody swoops in, I don't care who, Sony, Xbox, I don't care who it is, somebody needs to come rescue these IPs from Konami. Um, but who knows? I mean, Konami has at least acknowledged that stuff like Metal Gear Survive and Contra Rogue Core are really bad games that nobody wanted. And they're trying to correct that with whatever the new Silent Hill ends up being. So maybe they'll shock us. Maybe this new Silent Hill will come out and be incredible. And we can start looking at Konami as a serious video game publisher again. Um, who knows? That's I'm hoping, hoping and praying. Paris in the chat. What up, my man? How you doing? Thanks for tuning in. Um, he says you can be critical, but respectful. Exactly. I think Paris in the industry right now does a really good job of being a, a vocal person on Twitter who, you know, basically isn't afraid to make a statement and share his beliefs, but he does it in a way that doesn't isolate, doesn't offend, doesn't have any ill will behind it. Cause it, it can be fun to get on Twitter and stir the pot and, you know, get lost in the, uh, the console war soup. But you know, you gotta be respectful because at the end of the day, it's all people, everyone making games, everyone involved in the industry is a person. And, you know, as much as we like to brush off negativity and negative comments, it's, it can be hard. Like, uh, I'll just give you an example here, a negative comment, even though there are seas of positive comments on our, 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 our videos and our channel, like there'll be a negative comment and it sticks with me. It really does. I don't know why. I don't know why the negative stuff sticks with you more than the positive stuff but I try to highlight and, you know, embrace and respond to the positive stuff and ignore the negative stuff. But the reality is it's just kind of human nature. Like when someone says something negative about you or what you've worked on, especially if it's something you're passionate about and put a lot of energy in, it's really hard to just pretend like that doesn't matter at all. And like that doesn't affect you at all. Um, it really shouldn't one, one vocal person coming in and trying to discredit what you're doing or downplay what you're doing really shouldn't. But that's unfortunately just kind of, it's human nature. I don't know. I don't know how to turn, program that out of my brain. So yeah, I try not to, you know, even with quote unquote bad games or however some people want to spin it, I try not to just be brutal. I don't want to ever like, when I'm doing reviews, especially, I gave the Falconeer a six out of 10, which was, I guess, one of the lowest reviews that it got. And, um, you know, I thought my review was pretty fair. I tried to highlight what I loved about the game, but I wasn't going to ignore the stuff that I didn't love about the game. And I had done a preview of the game and really liked it. And so it was conflicting for me to have this preview, a good experience, and then go into the full game and then not really connect with it, not really even have fun with it. Um, but I wasn't gonna you know, try to just destroy what this person had done with this game and try to just downplay what they had done. Um, you, When you're giving feedback, when you're giving criticism, needs to be fair it needs to be constructive because otherwise you're just you're just kind of being a bully and you're just trying to tear someone down for an arbitrary reason 
Oh, JD Gamer with another super chat? Dang, okay. Uh, what game director would you give a hundred million for a game? What game director? That's interesting. Um, 100 million. Any game director, $100 million. I don't know. I'm, I need to give you an answer. Hold, hold on, I'm gonna circle back to that. Give me just a quick sec. I'm gonna circle back to that. Um, I, Cause I need to give you some sort of answer. You want a game director specifically, or can I give you like a studio? Edwin Suero with a $1 super chat. Message retracted. <laughs> well, I appreciate the super chat. I appreciate the super chat. And then I see Paris in here talking about the Konami theory. Yes, I'm. you and I both love going down the rabbit hole. I'd love going down the rabbit hole. I remember when people were trying to say that Windows Central came out and was basically leaking that Xbox was acquiring Konami. Um, just some random post where somebody came out and said that. And so that got me thinking like, okay, what, what would that look like? What would that, and that got the, the famous conspiracy theory that Bloober Team is actually getting one of the folks working on a Silent Hill project. That there are potentially two Silent Hill projects. Let me hit you with this. Let me revisit this conspiracy theory while I'm all ramped up. One, remake of Resident Evil 1. Boom. Two, a brand new reboot of Silent Hill being developed by Bloober Team. That is my current conspiracy theory on, on Silent Hill specifically. And then I threw out one wild one. There's no foundation for this at all whatsoever but imagine the possibilities of hellblade 2 launching ninja theory ships hellblade 2 kills it changes the game people love what they're doing and then they announce that they are doing a god of war-esque reboot of the castlevania franchise so they're going to give you an intense narrative third person action game set in the castlevania universe that delivers that same impact of god of war 2018 think about that for a quick second Again, no sort of reality to that particular statement, but it's a reality that I wanna live in. All right, so let me revisit the super chat. One, what game director would you give 100 million for a game? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say Bloober Team. I'm gonna say Bloober Team, not specifically a game director, because that's a t I don't, I'm having a, a tough time thinking of one specifically, but $100 million to Bloober Team to make whatever horror game they want. No, no IPs attached. No, this isn't Silent Hill. This is Blue Team gets $100 million and they are told, make the game that you've always wanted to make. Make the horror game that you couldn't do before. That's what I want to see happen because that team has amazing ideas. They've, they're a small independent developer who independent, independently publishes their games too. They're a, a very small kind of tight operation and I would love to see them get a big budget to just go wild. Even the medium, which was a huge step up for them, easily the best project that they've ever done in terms of quality, um, I'm sure didn't have a hundred million dollar budget, but let's go. I wanna see it, give it to them. All right, JD Gamer, um, Super Chat again. If you had to pick between Microsoft buying Warner Brothers games and with an infinite DCU game character license, plus the ownership of the Mortal Kombat IP or Sega, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, Edwin, oh, let me touch on Ed. Edwin, can you just type your, your question in the um, just general chat? You don't need to super chat it again. I'll, I'll get to it, but uh, it looks like for whatever reason, your super chat went through, but the message itself did not go through. I would say the WB, if DC was included, would be a bigger deal to a lot of people. I think the Sega thing fits more into Microsoft's plans of kind of growing their exposure and growing their appeal in Japan. So I think that's the better move. With if if DCU is not included, I don't really personally care about WB. That's not not to be rude, but in terms of like acquisitions or whatever, if you take DC out of that equation, you take Batman out of that equation, I don't really see as a company Microsoft buying WB. Um, because you know, you don't really get a ton because a lot of their stuff is licensed. So you're not getting those, you don't own those licenses. You're getting, you're getting some talented teams for sure, but, um, you're getting a lot of licenses more than you're getting IP. And those, once those licenses expire, the value of the deal is, is, is a lot less. So I think Sega makes more sense. I think Sega would be a better move, but DC would be huge. If they came out and said that Batman is an Xbox exclusive, 
the, the, the salt levels would be unreal. People would be up in arms. People would be screaming in the streets because I think Batman is really only the only thing that really touches the level of Spider-Man in terms of sheer kind of market share, mind share. People love Spider-Man. People love Batman. Like those two IPs carry a ton of weight. So if that was in the equation, yeah, that would be huge. If, if Xbox could come out and say that Batman is an Xbox exclusive, whew, that, would, that would be a big deal. That would shake some people up. All right, so we're, uh, I got, for the people watching live, I'm gonna be on Game On Daily here in about an hour. So I'm gonna start wrapping this up. So if you have any other questions you want answered, start dropping those now. Huge shout out to everyone who tuned in today. Again, when I, Earlier in the show, I talked about how I wanted this to be a community-centric episode just because of the news this week. So I didn't get a guest on. I just wanted to sit, talk to you guys about what this, what the Bethesda deal means, what the future of Xbox means. Clearly, people are excited. We had a ton of people in the chat hanging out, and I really appreciate it. Again, if you're new and want to revisit, we do this every Saturday live at 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, and then it's uploaded to YouTube after the fact, video on demand, if you want to watch it after the fact. But um, next week, I don't know if... Oh, if Paris is still in the chat here, but um, Paris should be on the mic with me. Paris should be in the hot seat. I'm really excited to sit down with him. He is a, a genuinely amazing dude in the industry, and he's always been one of those people I look to when it comes to very, um, very well thought out, mature takes on a lot of different industry news. So he's someone I'm really excited to sit down and chat with. Um, super chat from JD Gamer. Imagine Traveler's Tales with access to Rare IP. Okay. Okay, I'm thinking about it. It's in my brain. I'm imagining it. Um, that would be great because we know Rare doesn't really have an interest to revisit stuff like Banjo. Rare is really invested in pushing new ideas, pushing new IP. So they aren't going to revisit Banjo. And, you know, we have people like Double Fine that, you know, people were asking if, if, um, why am I blanking on his name? The head of Double Fine, Tim Schaefer. <laughs> Tim, they're asking if Tim Schaefer wanted to basically tackle a Banjo Kazooie. And he had a pretty funny comment saying, like, you know, there's a team that would probably do a better job. You might have heard of them, and they're they're rare. And so that comment to me kind of shows where uh, Tim Schaefer's interest is at. And I think moving forward, the the appeal of these teams working with Xbox is creating something new. Using Game Pass as a way to leverage a new IP. So I don't see a lot of these kind of established people like Tim Schafer and Rare revisiting old IP. But I do see them being really excited about what the future holds for them and, and the new stories and the new worlds they can create. So yeah, it would be cool to have a team revisit Banjo because Banjo needs to be remade. Banjo needs a reboot. Somebody has to step up and do it. Somebody needs to give the fans Banjo because it's, ah, it's, it's just sad. It's people want Banjo. People love Banjo. And it's, it's sad that it's been so dormant. There was so much energy when Banjo was announced for Smash, you could feel it. People were losing their minds that one of their, these iconic characters was coming back in this way. And so somebody needs to step up. Xbox needs to give some developer a chance to make a new Banjo game because fans want it. Fans really, really want it. And I think that would do really well. And especially with Xbox pushing to have more kind of family friendly and kid friendly games, Banjo would do really well. If you give us a Ma Mario Odyssey level Banjo game, something that comes out and completely reshapes what a 3D platformer can be, people are gonna be excited about it. Um, so yes, please, somebody, somebody do it. Somebody make Banjo, please. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, Paris says, just give Banjo to another studio. Yes, please, please do it. And I think that's gonna be it for me today. Huge thanks to everyone who tuned in. This this has been a really fun kind of silly show, and there you know obviously the Bethesda news was huge, and there there's a lot to talk about there. But a lot of it has just been kind of you know talking to you guys about what you're excited about and what you want to see. So love it, love the live show. I hope more people tune in next week. And until next time, this has been Miles with Windows Central Gaming, and uh, we'll catch you guys next week. Take care, everybody.